tensions were high. And we were in the areas after a shooting happened, trying to figure out what's going on here. So we're kind of harm's way because sometimes they will stay in a certain area, sometimes they will move on. The, the whole area was in a panic. I think that's better than killing Adam. You're terrifying the country. And plus, he wants to get back at the system. I think he, he kind of liked that. It wasn't a common 95 to be shut down after a shooting because they're thinking these guys went one way or the other in complete gridlock in this area. It, it was insane. Insane. And nothing I've ever seen like it before. And in his mind, he starts believing he can make this kid an assassin. Desensitize him mm -hmm. at 13, 14, just killing randomly. No connection, no ties, nothing. He said, did you kill her? He said, I killed her. He said, all right, that's a good start. How do you feel? Feel nothing. That's real good. You don't feel nothing. I like that. She kept calling me sweetie. She's like, listen, sweetie. She's, you're going to get caught eventually. She's, you understand, we will catch you. I go, well, what's taking you so long? And she said, listen, we're, you don't seem to understand. We're about 90% sure of where you are, sweetie. I go, well, only 100% counts. You'll come back to Tampa. Somebody will turn you in. You're going to get pulled over. Let me clear this up for you. I said, I've had two dozen driver's licenses in other people's names. I said, there's nobody in Tampa I want to see. Unless you want to have this conversation in person. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Ignacio Esteban, and we are going to be talking about active shooters, the DC sniper, and several other related cases that he uh, has in-depth knowledge of. It's going to be a great podcast, so check it out. And, and also the rivalry between the FBI and the ATF within DOJ. And, right. And, and, and that has never ended, but I know we have been, I talked a little bit about Vivek Ramaswamy, right, and the stuff he's saying. He wants to abolish the FBI. Right. That's one of the first things he wants to do. I mean, I've never heard anybody ever say they want to abolish the FBI. And, and, and it's because of political reasons. He, he sees them going after Trump, politicizing the whole, wep the whole political weaponization of the Department of Justice is what he's seeing. But at the same time, he is, he is young, but he is a self-made billionaire in his 30s, right? Right. He, he's, I think, 38, going to be 39. He's done very well, Harvard grad, Yale grad, right? And him, he's moved up really well, really fast. He's been a successful writer. I mean, if you haven't read some of his books, New York Times bestseller, Woke Inc. Woke Inc. I mean, right. if you haven't seen that, right. I don't know. Have you read the book? No. Matt? No. I read excerpts and then I've heard him talk about it. And then just watching, which which makes sense. I mean, sometimes we're getting to a point where he says you want to check off the boxes if you're a company or the age. That's for the, for the, for the government. You know, it's all about having competent people, right? But you're not getting that sometimes. And they're just right. checking off boxes. I want a certain category of people here. Check, 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 check. I want certain religious people here. Check, 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 check. And it's about checking off the boxes and not having people who are competent to fill these positions. Right. That, that's part of the essence of Woke Inc. So I found it pretty, I read excerpts from it. I found it good. And I heard him talking about it. So he's, he's also a best-selling author. He's written a lot of books out there now too. He's so he and he has a good podcast show too. So if you haven't seen his podcast show, I kind of recommend it if you're kind of want to know what he's about. He had Bill Barr out there, from, former Attorney General with Donald Trump, and he had really good opinions because he wants to seal the border. He he thinks what's going on now is disgraceful right now. It, it is, which is how much open border we have in the United States. We didn't have that with the Trump administration. They're right. harder shutting things down, but it, it seems like he said, "Can I use the military?" Which asks some good questions. You know, can I use the military to A, seal a border and B, go after the cartels in Mexico? Remember we talked about that? The right. The only way to go after the cartels is to militarize and pretty much go to war with them. Right. He's bringing that to those topics up. How, how, how we can, can we do it? I said, well, they're a threat. We have laws. The, Mex the Mexican government is soft on cartel leadership with Lopez Obrador, right, who, who's a Mexican president. He, he's pretty much wants a peace pact with them. As long as you don't kill our people, I don't care what you do to the Americans, right? Yeah, I, I was going to say, you don't have to de even declare war. Let's face it. The last war that was declared was World War II. He, he could just say it's a it's a military action. and right. Police action. Call it police action, right? Yeah, that's exactly. what we call it more. Police yeah. action, right? That, yeah. that's, that's what they have so, to do. But that's, a, that's how to be serious about it. So those are interesting things. He doesn't like the war in Ukraine. I'm, I, I, you know, I don't agree with everybody 100% anything. Obviously, right. right. The, the things you agree with is something you don't. We, I, I do believe there's sovereign nation. That what Putin's done is wrong. He, he is a uh, an indicted war criminal from The Hague for kidnapping all those children. Now those children are, are believed to be dead. So not only they take them from these regions, these poor children that are believed to have been massacred. It's, it's really horrible what, what's going on out there. I understand that we don't want endless wars. 
yeah, I don't want another Afghanistan either. I don't think we want to spend another 20 years, spend a trillion dollars and look at the disaster, what happened, how we left it with Biden. So yeah, we, we they already have most of their country. Then there's a the disputed regions, you know, Crimea and you have Donbass, right? So that's more on the Eastern side. Most likely they probably won't be able to join NATO. There, there's kind of things, maybe you have peacekeepers out there. You want peacekeepers to come up with the truce but for us to already spend $120 billion. Right. 120 and counting. We're going to go to trillion dollars in this, right? What's NATO doing? How much are they putting in? This is their backyard, right? These are things that, you know, I think good valid points he, he brings up. So I thought you, when you said we talked about the FBI and ATF rivalry, I said they might not be an, an FBI. And, and who knows who else he's going to buy? Oh, the Department of Education. He believes in school choice. He doesn't like the public school system. Right. Yeah. He was saying abolish the uh, Department of Education. Department of Education. Yeah, he doesn't like the EPA either. I mean, he, he doesn't. <laughs> uh, obviously, anybody that bucks up, he he believes. He doesn't say it's a hoax, climate change, but he's close to it, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm along those same lines. Like, look, I obviously, obviously, that the planet is warming, but the planet has warmed and cooled throughout its history. I mean, that's just the yeah. way it is. Yes. You know, there are sunken cities that they find all the time right now, and it's like, okay, well, that was four thousand years ago. We weren't putting anything into the atmosphere four thousand years ago. Yeah. You know it. It. You know it. There. It, it, it ebbs and flows, reason. right? Ebbs and flows in anything, right? And, and planet. Uh, yeah, we were in an ice age almost like three thousand years ago. So and now things would cool off again. So it, it, it just is cyclical, and and that's one thing I knew with the planet. It, it's very much cyclical, but but that has people have an agenda where they want to cripple. That's one thing I've noticed with the left. They use regulation now. They can't nationalize like they used to. Right, but they can cripple companies with massive regulation, and, and environment is right is right there. How they can cripple companies, making things do more and more and more. So I found him interesting. I've been watching him a lot. I know you did the show with Patrick Bet David, right? Right, years ago. I kind of saw a little bit of it. Yeah, you got like a lot of views out of that one. Yeah, it was a couple uh, million. It's over a couple million. Couple million. That right? was better than concrete. I think it's over two million now. And they're both about the same, right? Oh, or maybe better. Yeah. Uh, he did a great town hall with, with, with Vivek, an amazing town, unbelievable numbers, standing ovation and everything. It's I think it's good to, to listen to him. He's also been on Hannity. He's been on all the big names. You know, you, you check him out and see what, what he has to say. He's young. I know Trump calls him Young Vec, the Vec because he gives everybody a nickname, right? Right. But, yeah, Trump's lead is so enormous. I, yeah. I just don't see anybody catching. Right. 60%, 62%. I mean, it's unheard of for five, six people in, in a primary. That's He's even better than he was in 2016. Oh, if listen, he's, it's, it'll be his landslide if he just gets himself indicted a couple more times. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shirt, have you seen that with, with his shirts with, with his mug photo? Yeah. Everywhere? Oh, people yeah. People are talking about that. that. He he purposely worked on that and that smile or not 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 smile, that look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he practiced in the mirror a few times. I think he did. <laughs> Very popular shirt. He's in coffee mugs. It's all over. You name it, it put that over. It's making them a lot of money, fundraising, 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 and to you know to fight the system, fight the power. They're coming after me, and they're all Democrats and everything else. So it's feeding into his one. The thing is, like I think we we've talked before. I think he might pick Ramaswamy for his VP because he's the only one that said I would pardon him on day one. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Listen, this guy he's he's very calculating, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they'd they'd be they'd be a, a great team. Listen, I thought he and DeSantis w- would have been good, but you know, DeSantis is like, oh, I'm not really a second chair guy. It was like, God, you know, DeSantis really, honestly, never should have run. He should, you know, I, I would I would be terrified to run against Trump. Oh yeah, Trump will eat you alive, man. right? He's gonna he's gonna gut whoever whoever whatever opponents are against him. He's gonna gut him. So it's like. You know, even if you beat him in the primary, he will have done so much damage to your reputation by that he point. He can't win. Yeah. Listen, well, Jeb I mean, Bush. Names, as he gave everybody Meatball Ron. Yeah. Right? Remember uh, Jeb Bush? He was like low energy yeah, Jeb Bush. Jeb, yeah. I yeah. can't even look at Jeb Bush now without immediately thinking low energy. I he guess is I energy. just. But it, yeah, but he is, you know, lying Ted, little Marco, crazy Nancy. I mean, he, he was the king of the names, and they stuck. And people said, "Yeah, that's, that's that fits them. That's that's about that's about right." So I think, in case this is a good scenario, Trump needs a backup plan. Let's say he does win, right? And he does have Vivek as his running mate, right? But right. He said he would pardon him, right, if he's president. 
And let's say the, the Republicans lose the House. The, right now, the Senate's tied. Let's say that they lose one, and now they're minority, and he's convicted. He's a chance he might get impeached and maybe this time removed. It'd be the third time. And then last time, second time, there was a lot of votes, Republicans, in the Senate. He just wasn't removed because of about 10 votes. So maybe this one he does, but guess what? Vivek will be president, and he'll pardon him right away. Well, that's that's those are for federal charges, state charges. You know, the he, he's, he's trying to get that all taken federally. That's the whole plan. That they, because he's the president of the United States, the state can't hold water to him. It's going to so, have to go federal. federal. Everything has to go federal. Every anybody in Georgia, that, that whole case in Georgia, by, by the way, that's I think that's one of the weaker cases. You're putting all 19 up there for freedom of speech, for for especially attorneys for having their opinion. I mean, yeah. there, there's a lot of precedent there that has never happened before. So. I don't know about that case. I think they're you, you push the envelope with the president of the United States, former president, who's running for office against a political opponent, which you're raised your party in. I, I don't like any. That's banana republic stuff. I hate to say it. That's yeah. Well, what, what's see. shocking is every president in the last you know 50 years, you could do this as soon as they leave office. You could turn around. All of them have done something. Have done something. Something. You know? I, I agree. You're you're lying. You know, George Bush lying to the American public to to start get us into involved in a war. In you know Iraq, or in you know Afghanistan, and you know all of these different things. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, like, you know, like like you're you're blatantly lying. There are those those Tony Blair the memo or the notes from his from his I forget whether it was his secretary or something had all those notes with where Tony Blair and Bush had been discussing like shooting down a, a YouTube spy plane. Like, let's fly it. We could fly it over. Um, bad dad and get it shot down and that'll give us a reason to like he had all these ways he was trying to get into justification. a justification yeah, justification like, what are you doing yeah and, and at the end that's a war we shouldn't have been in Iraq right. was a war we shouldn't have been Afghanistan we get because of the Taliban and, and, and still at the end of 20 years all the money invested the security forces they didn't want to fight yeah they let the Taliban take over Right. Really? After 20 years, we trained you guys, we provide you everything, and you're not going to fight, defend your country? Because there really are so many different ethnic groups in there. They don't want to be a country. So, so you know, I, I I remember I dated this chick. This was 20-something years ago. This was when we were, we had just like, this was during, a, was it Iraqi Freedom or Desert Storm? I want to say it was, I don't know. Anyway, I think it was Iraqi Freedom. Anyway, I remember dating this chick and she had dated, had dated for a couple of years, an attorney that worked for the CIA. And I remember him saying that democracy would never work in those countries in, in the Middle East. Yeah. And, and I was like, and I was like, well, and I said, that's why would you say that? And she goes, I don't know. He said that just based on, I agree. Uh, he said, she said that he had told her based on multiple studies that had been done that will never be released. He said, it is just a proven fact that those, that those types of people have been ruled for centuries. And that's simply that they're simply okay with having a ruler. They don't, they're not interested in democracy. They don't know, like the moment they come into power, they tend to become corrupt <laughs> They tend to try and take advantage of the situation. They and he was he was he had this whole theory, or I don't even know this theory. He was saying that the CIA had done all these studies on it, and and she was like, and he's saying it'll never work. It's just never going to work. Yeah, so, I, I agree because it, it's also a lot of it, it's different ethnic groups, and they don't like each other. Right. You know, you, you have all these different. And these are all Muslims groups, and, and they're always fighting amongst themselves. So they don't like each other. They don't want to be ruled. Democracy, imagine sitting down. I mean, it, it took us. I mean, you look at Americans, we're a melting pot, but it's always not easy to transition, right? It takes time to, to mold and to get adjusted to living with other, oh man, Catholic. Remember Catholics and Protestants was a big thing? Mm -hmm. they, they didn't like each other, right? They, they brought all the tension from, from Europe to the United States, uh, the Irish, Italian, Spanish, you know, I guess the Protestants, the white Anglo-Saxons, you know, they had that issue. We had tensions here. Of course, blacks, Native Americans, I mean, Chinese, it, it takes a while and generations. But if you don't work on that, having people mold together, live together, tolerate each other, that they're not going to, they're going to kill each other and, and they hate each other. I mean, and, and you see it, and even you go to Africa, you know, you, you see the, the Hutu, remember, and the Tutsis and, and Uganda, now Uganda and Rwanda. Rwanda, it was a million, or between 800,000 and a million 
Tutsis were massacred. Massacred, and they, and they lived. Have you ever seen Hotel? Have you ever seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? Of course, that's a good movie. It's a, it's a great. It's a great it's a great telling of that story. Yes. The great way they did tell it. It also showed how inept the UN was at being able to do anything to even to stop any any of that. It, it was uh it was a yeah, it was just such a bloodbath. And, and they did it with weapons. They did it with machetes. Machetes. They're cheap. Cheap and, and it's br- it's gruesome. It's it's brutal. Oh wait, wait. What was the the call sign was or the 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 sign was a uh, uh, chop down the tall tree. Yeah. Time to chop down the tall tree or something. That, yeah. As soon yeah. as that went out, they all just started butchering them. Butchering people and killing each other and going back and forth and genocide. It. So, and they've been together. And my point with that was they've been together for generations, right? These people. Mm-hmm. And, and they and they hate each other. And they hate each other. So, it's hard when, when people live in the same space, but don't accept each other. It's hard for democracy because they don't trust each other. So, that's the biggest problem in Iraq. Even though Iraq's getting a little bit better because Iran was funding the wars, and, and try to have this instability of the Shiites, right, and the Sunnis, trying to make that really ugly attention and the Kurds up in northern Iraq, different. It, it was a really ugly situation. Really, three different people in one country by Saddam Hussein. And, and at the end, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, he was a piece of shit. There's not, no row around that, right? Right. He's also, you know, was a brutal dictator. I, I'm glad he got hung at the end because what all the stuff he did, but it's just a complete civil war disaster. And it's cost us, you know, we're still there. People don't know. Americans. We're still there in Iraq, by the way. So you know what what kills me? He, here's here's I have so many unpopular opinions. Um, There's no unpopular opinions. Here, here <laughs> so here here's the thing. Um, like to me, if you want, l- l- let's take some place like Haiti right now, mm-hmm. which is a disaster, point. right? Okay. Like okay, Haiti, they're they're pouring out. You know, help us, help us. I, I have no problem. Listen, we we can we'll we'll land the Marines. We'll we will swarm that whole island. We've done it. We will we will take that whole island back. But guess what? You're now a state. So you just make it a state. There's no Puerto Rico. No, no, Puerto Rico's now a state. We're not giving you aid. You're paying income tax. You're gonna get to vote. You become a state. That's or or we don't help you. Yeah. If 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 you know you really Russia as a state. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. So you just you just don't do anything. But to, to dump a bunch of why or, dump a bunch of resources into something or, or that's not what's going the to... UN good for? No, what nothing, is all, no. the, all the money we pay for the UN? The UN that's right. good for the UN. That's a good project for them. Hey, you right. know what? Get the peacekeepers out there. They're they're not they're, they're they they get in there. They can barely do anything. They can't what I'm there. saying is, if you want to go into Ukraine. And you want to help Ukraine? If you're going to dump that much money in, then just yeah. say, "Look, we'll just we'll just take invade that country and make it a state." So now it's the state of Ukraine. And now Russia, if you want to try and oh, you, you okay? Well, then why give them any money at all to what stabilize them? They're never going to pay us back. No, they can't pay us back. They're, right. they're going to be. They're going to say they're going to be a great ally until twenty years. I mean, as long as Zelensky's there, he goes. He he passed away twenty years from now, thirty years from now, what have you? They forget. You know, a lot of countries forget all the good things we did in World War II, right? You know, the the, the French are the most famous for kind of bad mouthing America. If you travel a lot to, to Paris or France, I don't know if you have. Oh, bro, they're you, all like that. They they you, kind of the Germans they kind of forget because it's in ancient history, and they say, "Oh, the Americans are uneducated; they're so crass." And blah, 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 blah. they they just put down the Americans like they're trash. But you forget America's the richest country. If there's a problem, like if, if Putin was to invade Paris, you know, go who's going to be there? We are because you're a NATO ally. So quickly they forget. Well, so, so I was in the Netherlands, right? I went to Amsterdam to shoot this episode of Inside the Mind of a Con Artist, right? So I go there and I'm there. I don't know what I was there. Five days? Six days? Anyway, I was there. And listen, like the directors and stuff, like pretty much after I'd shot most of my scenes, the one of the director, no, it wasn't the director. Yeah, yeah. One, it was one of the directors or the film guy, mm-hmm. you know, and, and several of them. We're sitting around and they, they, they would ask me different questions, little here, little there, no big deal. But then they started getting into politics. <laughs> they, were like, they were asking me these little co- questions and they were like, why are Americans like this? And why are Americans this? And why? And it was real snide. And I remember saying, you know, it's funny. You seem to have a negative, they do. A, a negative opinion of America. I said, but every time there's a war or there's a problem, I said, I don't see the Netherlands coming to anybody's aid. They don't. And I said, so you ask us to come to people's aid and then you complain about how we did it when in fact you don't give any money, 
you don't send your troops, I said, or you send your troops. Sending in the Netherlands, you might as well have the South Carolina National Guard go in. Exactly. I mean, it's not, it's not much. You know, it, it's it's nothing. Like it, it's 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 a minor minor military force. So it's like so you know you're bitching and moaning, and he was like, well, he he said it's not like there's any wars going on, and America's still doing this. Still, and listen, six months later, yeah, well, no, a year later, Russia invades. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, yeah, and it's like I wish to God I'd been, you know, yeah, I, yeah. if at that time you'd be like, oh well, I see you now. You, well, they need help. They need that. The Netherlands is tiny. You can't do anything. Okay, you, well, you, you want to spend money. Yeah, at the moment, the moment the Germans invade, you're begging for help. Sure, and that's so I, I, I just don't. You're right. It's the short memory, and then it, it's please help me, please help me, please help me. But I need you to do it like this. And I need you to be yeah, careful about you. this. And I need, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, to me, I'd be like sink or swim. You want to be, you, you want to be a state? We'll make you a state. <laughs> exactly. The, uh, yeah. That, that's, that's frustrating going to Europe. I don't know if uh, your audience has traveled out there sometime. I've been in Europe a lot <clears throat> and it's, it's changed. The younger generation forgets more and more because, you know, if you don't study history, you know, those who don't know history, don't repeat it. You forget about the Nazis. You, mm -hmm. you forget about the communists, the Soviets, you know, Eastern Bloc and, all this that we're helping, we, we, you know, the Marshall Plan. You know, that's the U.S. We helped rebuild Europe after. Not only did we liberate them, we rebuilt them. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Can't forget that either. Goodness, and and, and and but yet they don't like the way. And but I tell people, America is very different. You go to the Northeast, it's a different kind of culture. The Midwest goes to the South, right? You go to the West. So don't just say, "Oh, America's all the same." And, and very different. And people in the cities are very different than people in the suburbs. People in the country are very different. So you really can't just say all Americans all the same because they kind of think we're a bunch of ignorance or some ignoramus of walk out. No, bro, that's not the way it is. There's a lot of people very different. So no, look, the, the difference between one people brush. in Florida and the people in California, you go to yeah. California and say you love Trump or put it, you, you're going to get clubbed to death practically. I mean, it's, it's insane. <laughs> so. But I do hear a lot of Californians who are fed up with uh, Gavin Newsom. What are they doing? Coming to Florida. Yeah, but then they'll come here and they'll try and change Florida. Uh, well, you should yeah. be doing this and you should be. No, yeah. it's fine here. I love Florida. Yeah, that, that's what I, I've been telling people is that, you know, they want to escape from New York. They want to escape from California, from the ultra blue liberal policies, escape from Chicago. That's great. But don't bring those policies with you. Right. You're going to destroy the state. They're doing that in Texas too. East Texas. I'm sorry, West Texas, you know, El Paso, and all. Uh, you had, uh, what's his name, Bennett O'Brien, um, mispronouncing his name right now, he, he's gone there. It's getting very blue, that area near El Paso is growing and growing and growing. That's, that's a big problem. Austin also, the capital. So you're seeing big waves of blue, which will give Ted Cruz maybe a hard time when he goes back for the Senate. So that that's a problem that they're spreading around, and they're going to ruin the policies of different red states. But Virginia, where I'm at, is different. They turn around because a lot of people from different areas have come to Virginia and uh, the governor here, Glenn Youngkin, he had a big upset two years ago as a Republican governor and a lot of big wins in the midterm came out that way. And Virginia is looking bright red right now. So that's a good thing. So you, you pick and choose some states, I guess. But Virginia is different. So politics, interesting. So going back around again, you know, we'll see if the FBI gets abolished, if the VEC wins. <laughs> I, I've never heard anybody ever say that, by the way. For the record, I, and the FBI's been around for over 100 years. Right. I said, hey, reform, work on get, get these bad apples out, but abolish the FBI. You know, they do a lot. People don't realize they do a lot with terrorism, and they do a, a lot with espionage, and a lot with uh, white-collar crimes. ATF, obviously, with my agency I was part of, did a lot with uh, violent criminals, you know, gang members, repeat violent offenders, you know, international firearms traffickers. So for him to want to abolish, he said, I like the agents. But I want to get rid of the bureaucrats. So, okay, so what are you going to do with all the agents? Then? You shift them to the Secret Service <laughs> and then take over those responsibilities. Yeah, I the, mean, the marshals, the marshal service. Well, yeah. Well, well, are they going to be a part of the I, I don't know. But that's, that's, I like his ideas, but he hasn't really thought them out. That's, that's, that's what my, my thing is. You know, it's good to say things, but you got you got to be able to back it up. So Vivek's an interesting cat. I think I might do, I just finished a book, Inf Infamous LA Murders, which is right. pretty good. Um, I'm going to work on maybe Vivek. Rama Swami, Vivek Rama Swami, parents from India. And uh, it's, it's funny too, but immigration, he's kind of funny that way. They said Soros Foundation paid for his, his going to Yale Law School. 
So I'm a, I'm gonna look in, into that. And you know, people are very cut like Soros and everything else. Right, I, right. I, I think he was growing up a Democrat. I think he became a libertarian. And then when he became a billionaire, of course, he's a Republican. Because you, you can't be a billionaire with remember Bernie Sanders says billionaires should not exist in America. Remember that? Elizabeth right. Warren. Billionaires should not exist in America. Wow. What 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 are you gonna do? You keep on taxing. That's a problem with, with the left. They don't want billionaires. They say that's too much power. You shouldn't be a billionaire. So they want to take your money. But that's listen, that's, I love Elon Musk. Yeah. I mean, it takes a billionaire to say, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? Pretty much got this whole life thing worked out. I mean, granted, I can't keep a wife and I'm my kids are a mess and my parent, my father won't talk to me. And you know, obviously I've got some big you know, becoming when you're partially when, when you're partially Never. um what do they call that? Now he's uh, the richest man in the world. When you have Never. a little touch of Asperger syndrome like he does. Oh, that's right. Good to say that. Um then you know, you're not gonna be perfect in every every avenue but the fact that he became a billionaire and then he said you know i'm going to take this money and i think i'm going to go to mars like you know, what wow. what yeah. you know even the idea i'm going to i'm going to electric cars electric cars and the, yeah but there's no power grid well i'll make that like what are you talking about you'll make that how are you going to do that like yeah. it's just the idea and then to try and make that happen and know hey i'm willing to fail like his big thing what i was thought was he hilarious failed. was he was yeah, like he yeah probably i don't really think it'll work but I'm going to be okay. Even if it fails, I'll be okay. And if it works, well, great. I'll be, I'll make even more money and then I'll be able to do something else. But I think it's important to further humanity. Like that's, that I think is amazing. Now, if you're just a billionaire to be a billionaire and to be an asshole, okay, well, I get it. Like, you know, but I also think if you're that guy that has that, it's like athletes that make, that make $50 million a year. Look, if you blew through your whole teens and you busted your ass the way these guys bust their ass and yeah. you went up and you competed against all these other guys and ultimately you ended up at the top like you you deserve to make some money a of chunk course. of money yeah of course so, and sponsorship and everything else. not only did, did he become billionaire he became the richest man in the world in the history no man in the world's ever made this kind of money i, I think it's over close to what uh 100 100 billion i mean it, it, the, the numbers are insane the, the, I don't know what the numbers are. Made. I just want to see us go to Mars. I, I want to see that in our lifetime. That would be cool. No, yeah. That, 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 would, you, would you want to go on the first uh, shuttle out there? Bro, I'll go even if I think it might blow up. I'm ready to go. Like, how, that's if I'm okay with going out like that. I mean, I've had a pretty good life. Like, yeah, that, that's a hell of a way to go. Um, I mean, it's going to be fast. That? You wouldn't even know. How about if you get stranded out there, man? I mean, you know, I could lose some. I saw the Martian. That's right. I saw right the Martian. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I probably, I don't think I could grow anything. Right. I yeah, I some stuff half, and eat and, yeah. yeah. Half the science he knew, I don't know. Like, unless there's enough food, I'm definitely not making the next rendezvous. Yeah. Hopefully there's a lot. Hopefully there's water. They say there's underground water in, in Mars and the caverns and all that. So hopefully there's some yeah. water to drink. Yeah. There's, there's, listen, I, I watch stuff on Mars all the time. Yeah. So I, love I, I, I love the idea of going there and colonizing. I just that'd be, that'd be really also think it needs to be somehow or another, they need to be able to generate some kind of you know they need to be able to generate there needs to be a reason i mean going there and saying okay we're there but i think to have a colony you have to be able to generate some kind of income to sustain the colony at some point they sure. have to work toward that not just hey we're here and we're hanging out on mars okay well that's a vacation right you have to be able to generate or I, I think eventually people are going to there and, and maybe they, they will have a resort out there you go hang out and then you go to a hotel and they're making money and, and they'll do it. It'll be a little, you know, it'll be obviously the environment is harsh. Right. So you, you have to change it and make our own special environment with these little globes and all that they have out there and, and, and indoor, in, indoor, pretty much indoor living. You have your mask and everything else out there, but they do have some nasty storms, harsh environment out there. Those are things that we have to work through if we're going to be colonized and living there, but it guarantees our species it will exist if something happens in Earth survivability survive our species i think so there's a there on apple there is a a series called i think i want to say it's called for all mankind and it starts in the 1960s with us going to the moon only oh, we don't go to the moon right okay. the, we, we go to the moon but the soviets land first okay 
So it's what if the arms race never ended? Like, listen, by 2000 or by like, like really by the mid 1990s, we're already on Mars. 1990s. 1990s. Listen, like they've got all these technological leaps. Wow. Because they never stopped funding the Apollo program. Sure. It just keeps going and going and going. It's listen, it's, it's honestly, it's a great, it's a great series. You're you're like, what's it called again? I want to say for all of man, for all mankind. Well, and and Apple streaming on on Apple. Apple. It's amazing. Apple has these series that are just pretty good. They're, they're all, all of them are like epic. Like they're just over the top. They took the move. They took the book. So this is good for you, for you and me. There was a book called Silo. Silo, huh? Well, no, no, it wasn't called Silo. The book was called Wool. It was the first commercially successful self-published book. And it was blowing the doors off of everything. Now, this is ba- This is in was in the early 2000s, like let's say 2008, 9, 10, 11, like, and Wool was amazing. And it literally took five or six, seven years before Apple ended up turning it into a series. And oh, well. now they call it Silo. It was originally called Wool, but they ended up calling it Silo. And it's, listen, I watched that series. That that series was it, pretty it, good. like an epic. Well, maybe, maybe they look at our books, Apple, and they'll, they'll, they'll turn it to a series also. I'm working on that too. I, I got that. my scripts done. So if there, anybody's out there from Apple looking, ATF Undercover, and, and of course your book also, you've done quite a few books too. Yeah, I've got. I don't have as many as yours, but mine are mine are more lengthy. Mine are like two hundred and fifty to three hundred and thirty pages. Well, I got I got like seven books like that now because I, I merged some of them. So oh, I got okay. some helpful. And and shout out to Sean Milo, also an Audible. We'll give right. Sean uh, out there because ATF on the doing good on Audible. And and I have one coming out shortly. The most dangerous crime settings of our time. Like it's gonna be a seven hour listen. We're almost done. Almost there. Almost there. I have not heard from him recently okay i need to that sean so we'll, we're, we're going back to you back were to involved oh, in the I'll, I'll do, real oh. quick comment on the vec before we go to uh, bc snipers here okay if, this is funny stuff if you haven't seen the vec rap you, you know he's a he's a he also does rapping for fun he, he in, in college he used to do that and have a good time with it he does eminem that song he has uh, back to reality what, what's it called oh yeah <laughs> It's not called Back to Reality. It's uh, if you no, said Back probably... to Reality. Remind me, that's that's a lyric in the song. Right. Goodness gracious, I can't remember right now. And anyways, <laughs> Eminem got pissed because he used to do it at, at his rallies, right in Iowa. If you look at this, right, so he's, his attorney sent him a cease and desist. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. that. <laughs> and he was like, "I'm," he's like, "I'm," I, I feel. And Levesque was like, I, "I feel bad that that's how he feels. Like, I'm sorry that he feels that way." I think he's doing the because people were looking, you know, because this younger generation, it's been 20 years, eight men out. I mean, eight, eight miles out, right? It's not a right. long time. And a lot of people forgot about him. Mean, I remember because I was in my mid 20s and I went to the theater and I saw it and I was like, hey, that's cool and everything else. He even won an Oscar for the song. Remember that? And Emmy and the whole nine yards. But it's been a long time. So a long right. generation, they don't like it and said, hey, man, this might help you around. But he didn't take it that way. So he said he wasn't a Democrat, but I don't believe that anymore. Remember before he said he didn't take sides? Right. Well, I, I don't know if I, I buy that anymore. But Trump has been blacklisted also. If you look at the amount of uh, singers who are blacklisted from using their music in his rallies, the list is enormous. Unbelievable. I think if you're not charging and people are just coming in, I think it's freedom of speech. I think you should be allowed, if you want to sing along, like karaoke, why can't you do a karaoke at, at your campaign rally if you're not trying? Well, like they, they put a cease and desist. Yeah, but that doesn't mean like that. That's a, he doesn't have to. Like they can try and sue him, but mm-hmm. you know, that's what that'll be the next step. If he if he continued, they would they would take him to court. But you know what? Why he's not charging? He, he's just and actually he helps you sell more records. Right. Okay. Look. So so it's satire, right? The problem is they can write a cease and desist, and that's really probably. Probably Eminem's lawyer probably told him, hey, listen, you can't stop him from using your song for satire. Like the Supreme Court has already determined satire is free game. Mm-hmm. So he can do that. But if you want, I'll write a cease and desist letter. Now, what happens then is then Eminem can say, well, we wrote a cease and desist letter. I told him I don't want to do it and I'm going to file a lawsuit. He can do that, but you're going to lose. You'll lose. It, it, you'll get, it won't, 
it will literally just be dismissed because the lawyers will come back and say, look, the Supreme Court has already said satire is is fair game. And what about a weird Al Yankovic? Yeah. Just he does did. satire all the time. I don't need your permission, bro. Yeah. yeah. So I, go ahead. I, I think that's more egregious, to be honest with you, that what he's doing because he made money off it, right? This guy's not making any money off it. He's a billionaire. He's just having fun. He's just showing his other side. He has an alter ego he calls uh, – uh, like DJ Debeck, right? You know, Debeck, that's his name. He's DJ Debeck, and so he has a, the hat backwards. He has an alter ego that he performs. Right, which I think it's pretty cool. You know, you don't see a, a, a lot of these other guys doing that. Chris, you think Chris Christie is going to do that? No, no, <laughs> no. I, listen, I think that's the nice thing about even even Trump is that he just doesn't take himself that seriously. Yeah, these guys that take themselves so seriously. Oh my gosh, like, it's on. unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, it's if you haven't seen the debate, folks. Go check out the debate. It's entertaining. Devek goes back and forth. Uh, I, I like the great line that Chris Christie gave him where, where he says, you, you know, said, yeah, I think it pretty much called him a plagiarizing Obama's line about a hey, being a skinny guy with a strange last name might just become the president of the United States type thing. And he, and he, and he pretty much kind of insulted him a little bit. And he said, well, bro, come on, give me a hug. Because when, when Obama up, appeared in New Jersey with his governor, Man, he's all chummy with him. He says he's going to be another Barack Obama, one of the worst. You know, I said, well, bro, "Come on over here, give me a hug." <laughs> well, DC sniper, DC sniper. Okay, we'll go from that to DC. That's a, a the Beltway Killers. I wrote a book after the 20 year anniversary. I was out there, and I, I just started reflecting because I started seeing a lot of things after 20 years of Mohammed and Mavo. And I'm going to give a little impression. And then I'm going to go for those who don't know, I'm going to give a whole spiel. Who are these guys? Well, hey, can I ask a question real quick? Did yeah. You said, so I said DC Sniper and you said Beltway Killers. Is that what they were originally named? There's so many names for these guys. It's unbelievable. But I, I call the belt, the book is the Beltway, the DC Beltway. Right. I call the Beltway Killers, the name of the book. Oh, okay. So the DC Snipers, Beltway Killers, the Assassins. I mean, there, there, there's so many different names for, for Muhammad and Mavo. It's, it's unbelievable. And we've never seen anything like it before or after to be honest with you. And the profilers I went out there had it completely wrong. They had us looking for like Timothy McVeigh type or Theo Kaczynski says, oh, this guy has to be a lone wolf, white male, prior military, right? That's the profilers. I'm going to start with this. I wasn't going to, but let me okay. start with this. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to start with the, the profilers, what they're telling us, because nobody had any idea what was going on. Who's doing these killings? We were even chasing down a phantom white box truck for weeks thinking the killers were in this in this white box truck. So we're doing surveillance. We're doing everything else. And it wasn't anything at all like that. There'd be two black males. One did have prior military training. And and he had converted to Islam. And the other one, they were driving a 1990 blue Chevy Caprice, which they have turned into a sniper's nest. Right. You couldn't write this. And people will believe this. If you, if you made this a fictional story, people say, no way. This is impossible. They did what? And they did what? So- how do they get there to be these psychopaths, right? From, you know, Malvo, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a sad story for Lee, uh, Boy, Lee Boyd Malvo, right? It's, it's a very sad story for him because he's a young kid. He's, his parents are Jamaican, his mother. They go to Antigua illegally. Her mother, he's like 15, 16, abandons him, and she goes to the United States. She has someone else here, I think in the Fort Myers, South Florida area. It's in my book, the exact place she goes. He's by himself. Out in this island alone. And uh, Williams, he's not Muhammad this time, John Williams is his name. He later converts to Islam, but everything really starts eating him up and he goes over that, that path over there. But that, that's going to be a few years later. So he takes his kid on it because he knows he's by himself in Antigua. He, he pretty much takes him on his wing. But in my opinion, now knowing what I know now, he, he already has a bad divorce. He lost his children. He's an angry male, very angry. He was in the National Guard in Louisiana. He has all these issues. And in his mind, he starts believing he can make this kid an assassin. So what did he have like I pro like what why why did he focus on the kid and not just do this himself? That that's a good question. He he was executed. I, I don't think he ever answered those those questions why he did that. He was he would be executed pretty quickly after his conviction, by the way, in 2009 in Virginia. Went fast and furious. And he got actually but Mabo would not because he was a minor. And the Supreme Court thought that he shouldn't be executed because they thought he was uh, coerced or, you know, manipulated to become an assassin. He was if, if too impressionable 
and he, he turned because you know everything documentaries the books i read obviously i wasn't there during the indoctrination because he, he pretty much makes them a kill similar i would say to what the cartel do with young kids to make them sicarios right desensitize them mm -hmm. and at 13 14 just killing randomly so it feels like nothing it's like eating it's like breathing you took a life it means nothing right that's what he does right. with this kid he, he pretty much said because he has a military background he's a marshman he was in louisiana national guard he i think he was a mechanic or driver it's in my book but he was a good marksman good shooter so he knows how to shoot well so he teaches him so he adopts him kind of off paper right he eventually has him go to tacoma washington and, and this is where it all starts and it's just not in dc it will be later we will find out us investigators that this is a shooting spree that started in washington in february of 2003 and went all the way to october so th these guys are a nationwide shooting killing spree and doesn't come to a head until what happens in three weeks in october which is is pretty chilling if you haven't seen any of this stuff and i i experienced this and i saw firsthand the panic in this in the region you know i live here now again because i and i was there visiting from florida and i remember that some of the sites the gas stations and shopping centers i passed by i remember somebody was killed here I remember somebody else was killed here i remember this and that there, there was over 10 and 17 wounded you know just in that dc total of 17 total that's a lot to, to me these are psychopaths right uh, absolute social psychopaths that are doing this o almost because randomly you can almost say there's almost like serial killers but he, he does have a motive he does have a, a somewhat of a motive because of how angry he is what's going on so we start tacoma and we're looking at late 2001 about to go in early 2002 and he's doing a lot of training with him he knows he's looking for a fa father figure marvel is, is desperate for a fa father figure he looks at him as a father figure he wants to be loved right he prays on that that, that he knows that he says you want me to love you and appreciate you and everything else you got to do this for me you want me to accept you you got to do this for me you got to become this killer right the first house they start after training after months of training they're doing a lot of different physical fitness that he's preparing him for this journey and, and it's a lot you can see all the documentation of what they do to get there <clears throat> and then and then you see him and he's angry at his one of his neighbors for allegedly convincing his ex-wife to divorce him and take his children this is where it all starts right here okay. he wants him to kill him to kill her he's an older woman he says knock on the door when she opens the door here's the weapon he's 16 right blast her just kill her and, and get out so unfortunately she wasn't there it was in 18 or i think the ages in my book i think maybe 20 year old uh, her nephew her niece was there she opens the door he's just talking with her for a little bit and then blasts her and kills her that's a gnarly girl just kills her in cold blood boom 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 and bolts no connection no ties nothing off they go he said did you kill her he said i killed her he said all right that's a good start how you feel feel nothing that's real good you don't feel nothing i like that boom so they, they start their cross country journey they go to uh, arizona they steal before we got there they steal a bushmaster rifle which is gonna be the sniper's weapon a 223 rifle and they put optics on it right from an ffl a federal firearms licensee right in the tacoma area later bushmaster and this ffl would settle a major lawsuit with the victims of the families i think over 25 million dollars so just think about that, how all this progresses here. Me personally, my opinion is, it's not Bushmaster's fault that these psychopath picked a right. Woman. Why are they settling? Now, I'm not sure about the FFL, if he was negligent. I didn't get to read that part. If he was, okay, that's something different. If he didn't store the way he should have, he, or he let him have it, that's what's still controversial about it. That's the part right there that, that could have led up for that. But for Bushmaster to be punished, I know, I know sometimes it's easier to settle and get behind a lawsuit than keep on dealing with it. Yeah. And, and it's so, and, and it's such a high profile case. Like they, the, their fear is of course, what if we lose? Like then there's going to be a, a, a land bankruptcy pretty much because I think that the amount will be like 200 million or more, it'll, it'll probably be the end of your company. So those are legit things you have to factor into it also. But I, I think it's unfair. This is my opinion, retired ATF agent, Ignacio Esteban's opinion that you cannot blame the manufacturer for what these people did or anybody else, any other murder or mass murder, there is the problem between the years, right? It's not the weapon. And I think I've said in your show and other shows, 
you don't demonize the firearm when you have to check the person who pulls the trigger. Right. right? It's just an, it's just an object. It doesn't do anything in the wrong hands. I always say you want you always want a good guy with a gun to go after a bad guy with a gun. So, I was gonna say I, I I saw a TikTok where the guy said the guy goes well you know somebody was talking about out outlawing whatever outlawing you know assault uh, rifles assault rifles and guns and this and that and he's like right because if you outlaw them then people won't well, people will stop shooting each other just like when you outlaw drugs right you outlaw drugs drugs aren't aren't legal the whole 50 60 years that they weren't legal guess what people were still using drugs That's so right. the idea of outlawing um you know outlawing firearms people it's you ridiculous. can make them what you can make them with the fucking with the 3d, 3D printers 3d printers or or or, or you make yourself your gunsmith you just make yourself the parts and everything else not that hard to make it right uh, the weapons and, and all that so uh it, it's it, bad people like for example you know a lot of people are killed with knives in this country you should look at how many people a year are killed with knives, people stabbing each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's more people killed with knives than there are guns. guns. Are we allowing knives? No. And they're using common kitchen knives to kill each other. I mean, so it's it's the whole premise is so ridiculous. We're getting off point here a little bit, Matt. But Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. But I, I, I just I just wanted people to know that I didn't like, but they, they had to settle. I guess, like you said, they would have been, it would have been too costly. You never know. You get a bad jury. That's a problem with our system, too. You get a bad jury. Jury nullification, L.J. Right. Simpson, perfect example. And I wrote down my book, and that was my conclusion in that chapter. They had a bad jury. They should have filed in Santa Monica. They should never file a case in downtown L.A. Anyways, different thing right there. Maybe the same should have, principle should apply here. Maybe they should have filed out, out of Tacoma, but if they could, because it, maybe a little bias what happened there. So they start traveling. You know, they have they have this vehicle is a Caprice, like I said, uh, Chevy Caprice. Uh, that they end up making into a sniper's nest, a drill hole in the back, right? So he can poke the, the the muzzle outside, pull the trigger, right? And he just hides there, and the seat's up there because he pulled the seat back. He goes inside, which is Volvo, seat's up back, and like nothing. You don't think nothing's going on there. He could even hide back there if he had to. Right. right. Just a vehicle right there. So very ingenious. I mean, we've never seen that before. I've never seen anything like that before. And it, no one would expect the profilers, the prof no one would think these two will commit something like this. So they start killing randomly. They start in Arizona. There's a poor guy playing golf. They set it up, kill the guy playing golf. Down he goes. Keep on driving. Maybe they don't stick around. So it's hard. You have no connection, like like serial killers, the truck drivers with serial killers. Yeah, well, that's why they get away with it for so long. Yeah. There's just no There's connection. No, no connection. I pulled over at a truck stop and kill somebody two streets or grab somebody two streets over, how do you connect them to that? You can't. You, you can't. And, and there's no casing to recover because it's in the sniper's nest, right? The spent right. casing are there. It's a bullet fragment. Good luck piecing that together with anything. That's very difficult. It's easier to do with the casing than the bullet fragment. I know again, the weeds here a little bit, but it's hard to really match up bullet fragments, you know, with other ones. It's easier with the spent casing with the markings on the case. That's a lot easier to do, but they're keeping all that. Okay, so that, that evidence gone. And they're not even from that area. Keep on trucking. Louisiana, the same thing. They, they get involved in, in shooting and killing a lot of victims in Louisiana, his home state, right? Where he, he was in the National Guard. He doesn't care. He served in Louisiana, killing people, unfortunately. And I, and I know there's guys, unfortunately, that served that turn on the country. This guy, before, oh, and before he goes on this horrible trip, he converts to Islam. He, he ends up becoming Muhammad. He's not Williams anymore. Right. He's John Muhammad from then on. So they didn't call it a terrorist act at the time. Remember, it's only a year after 9-11 this is happening, maybe a year and a month after 9-11. But you have to look back now, it's, it's, it is a terrorist act, domestic terrorism. They're terrorizing people, randomly killing people. You know, Later when they need money, they start robbing people. But at first, it, and at the end, they start killing people again because of the enjoyment or the pain they want. Hey, you know, unfortunately, he says, you know, he suffered as a black male discrimination in this country. That's what he says, right? He's angry at his ex-wife for taking his kids. He, he's just all angry and full of all this stuff. And then he, he converts his poor kid who's craving a father figure, right? It's been abandoned and he's manipulating him to use him as a killer. It's a, it's a very sad situation on it all ends. I mean like his ex-wife made the right call. I think she, he would have killed her. No, no, of course. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. Of course, you made the right call. You, you know, know, I mean, like clearly, if she doesn't, she she divorced you and took your kids. I mean, look, look who you are. Yeah, no, they they 
It, no, of course. And he, and he and he was trying to trick them with a probation officer, not probation, with uh, to try to figure out where they were, where they were hiding, where they were at. And uh, he was trying. I think he wanted to kill them and also do family annihilation too. So I mean, the guy had snapped. Couldn't do that. So this is the second thing he wants to do. I want to punish other people. I'm right. I'm hurting inside. I want you to hurt also. And and that's the kind of guy he is. So they went. They they robbed people. Some people they'll be stranded on the side of the road, changing a tire. They'll come up to them, rob them, shoot them. I mean, they were attacking anybody and everybody. They go to Alabama. They need more money because they're hurting for money. So then they start robbing people more and more. So they go, hey, this is a liquor store. This is what will cost them because their thumbprints will be left at the scene. They will help match them later to this whole national crime scene in Alabama. So they rob this liquor store. They shoot the guy. He lives. They keep on going until we get three weeks in October, right? Until October 2002 and the shooting start. You start in D.C. You have in Maryland. Virginia, you got a task force developing. It's it's now it becomes over a week, and then all of a sudden they say, "Hey, we need a major response. We have no idea who's doing this. We have an elusive white box truck, and no clue what the hell is going on here." This was a panic in the region. I was an but agent. Where did they had me? I'm sorry. Like, where where did they come up with a white box truck? Someone saw a white box truck in one of the shootings. And that was it. And that so was they it. locked onto it. They locked onto it. Holy right. smokes, we locked onto that lead because that's all we had. People swore a white box truck was involved in that. It does make sense. I mean, it'd be it'd be a pretty good, yeah. you know, like you could move around, you could yeah. easily have a trap door, but they just did it with the car. But it's not like it's a it's not like it's out of the realm of possibility. It would, wouldn't be a bad <laughs> sniper. No, mask. no, but that's that's the lead we had. That that it wasn't much out there and people were panicking. We didn't know anything that happened before. We will find all of this later. These guys have been killing for months already, since February. They've been killing for months. Right. And now it's October, and it's all going to come to a head right now. I think they've had it. He knows this is going to end one way or the other now, and the shootings just get every other day, sometimes even twice a day. I mean, it, it was putting, I mean, 95 was shut down, and, and the media coverage was insane. I don't know if you remember how insane yeah. the media coverage was. It was out of control. So- they, they have a massive, it's all hands on board. I mean, ATF is sending most of their agents throughout the country. I was in Tampa and I'm going up there. We're saying, hey, we're sending people up there. I want out there. So, and when I go out there, I notice how people are panicking. The shopping center, people are gassing up, panicking their cars. Put Because he's, he's killing a lot of people at, at gas stations. You know, yeah, and, I remember you know, that. Company people at gas stations. Gas stations are putting like tarps, trying try to make it harder for the assassins, the snipers to see what's going on. People are just putting their pump, their, their the holes in, and then hiding inside the car while they're, they're gassing up. And people were even shot in the car while, while they're waiting. So people were absolutely panicking, and, and rightfully so, because no one knew what was going on here. This was, and after one year after 9-11, tensions were high. And we were in the areas, after a shooting happened, we were in the area trying to figure out what's going on here. So we're kind of harm's way, because sometimes they will stay in a certain area, sometimes they will move on. So were we ever in their in their realm there and their snipers? Possibly. So what are you doing there? Are you questioning people or no, we're, you... doing, we're doing surveillance because we know they're also using pay phones, right? We don't know who they are yet. Because then they start, you know, playing this cat and mouse game. They get sadistic about it. They they start saying, Call me men the terror cards. They start leaving even terror cards sometimes behind the scenes and they're saying, Call me God. They start writing the, the, the letters, they start saying the phone. It gets to their heads. That they, they are now godlike figures. They can take a life. They can do things. They really get out of control, that stuff. And they even want to extort money from the government. Say, if you want it to stop, you got to start paying us X amount of money for, for this to stop. Now, one of the phone calls, Chief Moose, I don't even remember Chief Moose from Montgomery County. Mm-hmm. He's a, he's a big male. He just uh, actually just passed away about a year and a half ago. And uh, he was very uh, controversial. Some people thought he made some bad decisions. He did write a book afterwards, after the arrests. And a lot of people thought that was going to hurt the trial. So he had to resign. Unfortunately, I think he went to Hawaii. That's just a side note right there. So we're doing surveillance. We're checking out the pay phones they use in case they come back because we know which ones they're using. So we're trying to see if we find them, we see them, what have you. But we really don't know what we're looking for because we don't have a clear idea yet. Not yet, but we will. But I remember one of the phone calls, FBI was an FBI Richmond office. And they said, hey, you're from Miami, right? Because you know, we're talking to different agents and everything else. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm from yeah, Miami, but I'm in Tampa now. They said, you're familiar with a lot of different you know, accents. I said, yeah, I know some, you know, Spanish and maybe Caribbean. So I started listening to the recordings. I know that we, they had those that they were making. 
and I listen to Marvel because Marvel is making some of the threats. And I say, I, I pick up a Jamaican accent. I pick up a Jamaican accent. And they were like, yes. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's interesting because his family were Jamaicans. He, he was abandoned in Antigua. That, and that, that was like giving an idea. And one of the scenes later, the, the thumbprints, fingerprints was recovered at a school shooting because they're also involved in school shootings. And they had left a tarot card and a letter also. Well, they match it up to one of his model's arrests in Washington State. They said, okay, we know who he is now. And then they knew that Muhammad was also very close with them. So they start piecing it together. And then from different crime scenes, it all starts picking up because they left their prints behind in Montgomery. So what I don't understand. So they they linked it to Mo, Mohammed? No, Mabel. Because Mabel, they Mabel. linked his finger, thumbprint? Fingerprint, yeah, because they had sometimes they'd be in the bushes too. They'd get out of the they, they'll get out of the the vehicle. And one of them was at school shooting in Maryland, the exact places in my book. I think Silver Springs. I'm not don't quote me on that. It's in my book. And they'll be in the bushes, they'll be shooting at the school, right? But they'll leave like a tarot card with a letter with their demands. Right. So he had been arrested before? Mabel was, yes, in, in Washington State. I thought he was just a kid. A minor. Yeah, he was. But, but, but okay, but his prints were available. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a huge, that's a huge break, huge break because the, the case will come wrapping up really quick within a week. Within a week, it is or after two weeks of complete not knowing who the heck these guys were. So all of a sudden, I remember CNN and everybody else, hey, we got the leads. We even got the plate number, New Jersey. This is who they are. And boom, it comes crashing extremely fast and furious, very fast. And well, they're arrested in uh, late October at a rest stop in Maryland. And the reason why, because you couldn't sleep overnight. And the trooper comes up to them and kind of recognizes the vehicle from all the information that's out there. Right. But they don't fight. Because I guess Marvel's sleeping, Muhammad's in the car, and the rifle's in the back trunk. So they're done. And they go in there and he says, hey, I know some things in here. I know there's a New Jersey plates. More troopers come. Boom. Without They, they arrest it without incident. Without incident. It's, uh, it, it was really, you know, it, it felt good that I was able to help someone. But I didn't like, and I know we talked about the ATF and FBI and some of the battles. <clears throat> uh, it seems like FBI kind of kept some information away from other task force that were working with them. They had their briefings, and then they want to share what they want to share. And I think if you're in this kind of critical incident, I think you have to share all the information. I put that critique in my book. You have right. to share everything because we're all risking our lives out there. We all can be shot. We're all in the hot zones right there. We're not hiding from them. We're trying to find out what's going on. We're looking at the phones. And later, I'll do more interviews. In fact, one of the, we did, or the, before we figured out Muhammad and Malvo, after our shooting, there was a white box truck in one of the scenes at a gas station. Those guys were picked up. They were Mexicans working in the area. And uh, they knew I spoke Spanish. They asked me to come in and help do the interview because all these guys in Virginia didn't speak Spanish. And I'm from, you know, South Florida. So I interviewed the guys and I already knew these people were, were just workers, right? right? They had no nothing to do with it. So, but it was a white box truck, right? So that that they, they didn't fit in. So those are things that I remember I was part of that helped piece together this major case. And I, I would stay weeks after that to help with interviews and 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 then logistics and and all that working with uh, other agencies uh, on this case. But if, in two thousand nine, um, I think I said before, Muhammad was executed in Virginia pretty quickly. And, and Malva wasn't. Well, so when they grabbed him, what Muhammad didn't talk. He said, "I'm not. I don't have anything to say." He eventually he he, he does. I mean, they they do. I mean, Malva cooperates because he he's, he knows that this this will do good. And, and Malva will be convicted of, of state life sentences, not just in Virginia, but also in Alabama, and also I think Louisiana. So he he if anything happens in Virginia, they just transfer him to another state. And he, he will never get out. Right. He will never, ever see the light of day. How old he was he when he was eventually arrested? He was 17. His whole life is going to be incarcerated. You know, it, just like the Manson family. Remember all these people over 50 years incarceration? Right. So I, you know, I always remember that, like, I thought the theory was that eventually Mohammed was going to kill his ex-wife. Like part of his plan was create this, or one of the theories was yeah. create this carnage 
And so if his ex-wife ends up getting killed, he's not going to be, he's not going to be a suspect because there have been 25 other people that have been randomly killed. Like just wait for his ex, find his ex-wife, wait for her to go gas up her car, shoot her. And she's just one of the DC sniper victims. I think I heard that too. One of the theories, but what I, what I see, what I've read in research is because I didn't personally interview, you know, right. um, but what, what I, I see is that I think they liked the news coverage. They liked that catamount. They, they really, at least he did. And I mean, Marvel did too. I mean, the, the whole area was in a panic. I think that's better than killing that. When you're terrifying the country and plus he wants to get back at the system. I think he, he kind of liked that. And, and he did. I mean, that, that's something I, I still remember personally. You know, people were panicking. Ninety-five. It wasn't a common. Ninety-five be shut down after a shooting because they're thinking these guys went one way or the other in complete gridlock in this area. It, it was insane, insane. And nothing I've ever seen like it before. Nothing ever. Hopefully, never see like it again. But I, I personally thought it was. A, even I was living it. I thought this was a domestic attack. And after all our work and everything else we we did out there, the uh, the director of ATF at the time, Brad Buckles, gave us a coin for our work and I have this on my cover. All the Beltway Killers. Right. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Sniper investigation. Yeah. I still you can't. don't have that framed? You're just walking around with it in your pocket? No. You don't have that on the wall? I have, I have it somewhere else, but it, it is, it, it's nice that I still kept it. Some people lost theirs, which is sad. It's, I try to keep everything I can, and you know, I have a little place in, in my house where it keeps some of these stuff. And I decided to take the picture of it. I thought it would be a cool book cover for Beltway Killers, and I, people have really commented about it because very few people have this. Right, it's very few. So it, it, it worked out. But I just didn't like, and and I, and then we, we'll you know transition a little bit to the rivalry with FBI. That's my first time experience. Obviously, that, that's going on. ATF and FBI have been going at it. For years and years and years, you know, you can look at Oklahoma bombing. <clears throat> we both right. had our own investigation. We all had our own lab. We were trying to send evidence to different labs. It, it, it was ugly situation in Oklahoma, right? What happened there? A lot of people had bad blood in Waco. Uh, ATF did not like that the FBI took over because it was their search warrant, right? With crash. Right. Why are they taking over our search? I mean, I mean, they can an incident after incident after incident. People don't know. There's a big rivalry. It's like the little brother, but the little brother can fight. You know, a lot of people think you know, FBI won, but a little brother hits back hard. Right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you my, another personal story here. So we're talking about shooters. This is a mass shooter. This is Parkland. So, so now we're looking at February 14th, uh, 2018. This is the second Valentine's Day massacre. The first one, obviously, Al Capone. Right. In Chicago, 1929, right? But he has an alibi, right? And I, I wrote, wrote that in my book. You know, Miami's history with the mafia. <clears throat> Very interesting. And I, I go a little bit deeper dive on this. This is the second one. Even deadlier than the first one. Because this is 17 killed, 17. And these are kids, by the way, Nicholas Cruz. So, you know, Nicholas Cruz, you know, you have Peterson who doesn't go in there, BSO detective. The shooting's going on. He almost gets convicted, by the way. I don't know if you saw the trial. Yeah. He starts crying. Yeah. He's acquitted, right? The family's just nodding his head. You know, the, these teachers had nothing. These students had nothing. He has a weapon. He stays outside. I mean, there's BSO arriving. Why did you not go two or three? That's, that's active shoot training. I, I've taken active shoot training. You got to go in. Right. These kids have nothing. I know you don't know where it's at, so you got to take cover. But there's plenty of cover inside. But you have to hear, like, the threat. Like, the right way was done in Nashville with a transgender shooter. Remember that? Right. Killing her f fellow students in her school. That she had, or he had, yeah. or whatever she was converted to a male, right? And they tracked it down, and they shot her because she was shooting back. They killed her, right? Why not go in? I, I just, I, I felt it was neglect of a derelict of duty. But he was acquitted because he said he was on the radio, he was calling. He, come on, the same thing can say with Pulse Night. Yeah, I don't need to be told to go in. There's kids. They died. You Seventeen know, like, killed. Seventeen. That's, that's atrocious. That's horrible. 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 So. We, we respond the next day to help out because the huge scene doing interviews. A lot of interviews, a lot of things going on at the high school. So we're there. That's at uh, the Parkland High School there. It's the Marjorie Stolman Douglas High School. That, and that's there in Parkland, which is west side of Broward County, just north of Miami-Dade County, if you don't know wh wh where it is right there. <clears throat> nice affluent area, by the way. So this is a nice area. This is something unheard of, unconscionable to be happening. 
But this kid had mental health issues. And the FBI later will pay a lot of money because they had a lot of tips that they didn't respond where he said that he was going to kill kids in the school, right? A right. lot of things. And they sat on it, did nothing with it. It would cost them dearly. I heard the settlement was enormous. The exact numbers in my book, I think it's over uh, with the victims' families, over a hundred million, maybe more. So it, it, it is enormous. All, all these factors playing. If you see something, you got to do something. You got to do your job. ATF, we're there. I'm in a task force with FDLE, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. We do firearms trafficking. They ask us because our expertise to come in. This is the locals, right? We're coming in, and the FBI doesn't like that. I remember, I tell you, there's a rivalry there. So they make false alle- allegations. That we're contaminating the scene at the high school. That we're contaminating the scene, right? right. We're to help investigate. He said, "I want him out of here." <laughs> so there's a the, the two A sacks and sacks are pretty much having a battle, and they don't want ATF on the scene because it takes away from them. And I, I hate to say it, and it's out there, but the FBI loves to be when they're there. They want everyone to look around them. Hey, look at us! Oh, of course, look at us! Look what we're doing here. Unfortunately, I haven't seen my book. And the sacks eventually have to have meetings and everything else. So we went with with FDLE and we did other interviews outside the school. We weren't processing the scene because there's so many people we have to still interview. It, it, but it's a team effort. That's why I go back to my experience with the Beltway killers. It has to be a team effort, but the culture exists. And a lot of people see that FBI one, right? It, it's streets named after them. One way, right? Right. And, and that's unfortunately, I mean, there's some good guys in there I've dealt with, but the culture pushes that, that we are going to want to drive this investigation where it doesn't lead that way. The form, at the time... Uh, Cruz was 18. He bought his rifle, his assault rifle that he used, right, at a dealer, at an FFL, Federal Firearms Licensee, right? right? Later, Florida would change to 21. Again, I don't believe in that. I think it, it's unfair for a lot of you know, kids who are 18 who are already adults, right? They're in the military. They got training. Why are you punishing them now, right? So now you can't buy a weapon at an FFL. It have to be 21, right? You might be able to buy you somewhere else or someone else, but now you're punishing people for a, one bad apple. Again, overreach, overreact. This is what you see in society, unfortunately. Someone does something bad, well, that's that bad person that you failed to investigate that you should have stopped, and the other public stayed outside. So these, the, and then I'll say, you want to blame the laws. No, no, that's, that's not, that's my opinion. That, that's a disaster. So we have the original 4473 that Nicholas Cruz has. It's an ATF form, it's an ATF transaction form, it's, it's an ATF. So we're part of the investigation. FBI is livid. They're absolutely livid that we have that form. They demand that they, they get it back from us. <laughs> so this is the nonsense. You, you're doing your job. I always try to do my job, and I always take it on minutia, but it is. That's why I call the book ATF versus FBI, the the, uh, the rivalry within the Department of Justice, within DOJ. So I, it's funny you mentioned that, the whole rivalry thing. So when I was on the run, I called the FBI agent in my case. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a couple of times because oh wow, because when I, I was I was on my way back, I, I basically I had almost I I just I'd almost gotten caught like two two three well about like three days two three days in a row, like I'd almost gotten caught by the U.S. Marshals. How, and how did you almost get caught? Well, at one point I went to a bank and I got handcuffed because the so the head of Wachovia's fraud department knew that I was committing a committing fraud. So he handcuffs me, or I'm sorry, not handcuffs, that they put a, a notice out. And so when I go in to get cash one day, that two deputies show up and they walk up behind me and handcuff me. They put me in the manager's office. I'm sitting there and they said, we're waiting for the, the uh, investigator to come. Uh, all we know is we're supposed to, to detain you. I'm like, okay. So, but they kept calling me Gary Sullivan. So, you know, which is who I was. I had a driver's license or not, an ID as Gary Sullivan. I they, borrowed a bunch of Did they money. imprint you? Did they send your prints? Oh, I'm still sitting in the drive. I'm still sitting in the in the bank. I was saying when the FBI show up, they didn't print you? No, it wasn't the FBI. So the so this is the the, the deputies. Oh. So this this investigator comes, he talks to me, I convince him that the bank may have made a mistake, but I certainly didn't. And while we're sitting there arguing, I'm sitting there arguing with the detective or the investigator and the head of Wachovia's fraud department, who absolutely was correct, by the way. He had it, he knew exactly what was going on. But I'm sitting there going, that doesn't make sense and this isn't right and that's not true. What, and what how are they accusing I you of doing? 
it was complicated. So, but the, the short version is this, I had borrowed about five or six mortgages on one house. Okay. And I was pulling money out of the house out of, out of different banks where I deposited these mortgages, mm -hmm. the money. So I'm just going in and asking for 5,000, 9,000, 7,000. And I've got like a dozen banks. Well, what happened is Wachovia, well, another bank found out that I had borrowed multiple mortgages. They contacted all the banks, one of them being Wachovia. And Wachovia contacts the authorities. They put a red a, a notice on the account. So the next time I come in, they call the detectives, they arrest, they, they handcuff me and sit me down. Detain you. The detective comes in, he starts to ask me, hey, what's going on? This is what Wachovia is saying. They're saying you're committing a fraud. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, you borrowed multiple mortgages on the same piece of property. And I go, is that illegal? And he's like, I mean, I, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know. Let's get Wachovia on the phone. We get Wachovia, the head of the fraud department. He's like, listen, he's got three first mortgages on this house. I said, that's not true. I have a first mortgage, a second mortgage, and a HELOC. And a what? Home equity line of credit. Oh, okay. And he's like, that's not true. So he's yelling. And I'm saying, I read those, those mortgages. One of them said it was a first mortgage, which was Wachovia. The next one said it was a second. And the next one was a HELOC. I said, and Wachovia's loan officer is the one that set all this up. She's the one that told me to go get a second mortgage from her friend. She gave me the first mortgage. A friend of hers at another bank gave me a second. And they had a mutual friend that gave me a HELOC. How would I know how to do any of this? I work at a labor company and I had a business card for a labor company and I give him my driver's, my, my ID. The guy looks up the ID. Well, what Kobe is saying, it's a fake ID. He's running a fraud, but it wasn't a fake ID. I'd gone into the DMV and gotten a real ID in the name Gary Sullivan. So he starts to look like he's crazy because he's saying all of these things that I easily can prove. And he's saying it's a fake ID and the detective knows it's not. So he's like, no, I think you guys have a problem at the bank. So he takes me downtown. I fill out a police report. He calls the, the, the local district attorney. District attorney says, well, let's look into this. I don't even know what to charge him with yet. I don't even know if there is a crime. Like, sounds to me like he just went in and got some mortgages. Sounds like this might be a problem with these banks. Maybe they, the loan officer did something wrong, but how would I know? Now, obviously I'd run, I'd actually borrowed six mortgages on the houses. They only found six. three. So how much did you borrow? Like a, almost a million dollars on a house worth about 230,000. So wow. listen, we're going to say, and it was, a, it was just a fluke that they even figured that somebody stumbled across it. But the point is, is that I went from there. I relocated when I went back to get my car, the U S Mart by this time, the FBI had been involved, had gotten involved and they put it together. Oh, so did. the U S marshals go to where my apart, my old apartment was. And when I go there, I'm getting coffee at a Starbucks. I get my ca my car. I happen I needed to go back to get my car. Well, I'm in the Starbucks and a couple of people from the apartment complex are in the Starbucks and they see me. And so one of them rushes out the back of the store because they'd just been interviewed by the U S marshals. Oh, the marshals were across the street. So I end up getting in my car. The guy follows me out. And as I'm about to pull out of the parking, the, the little, you know, it was curbside parking out of my parking space. He starts screaming, you know, he's right here. He's right here. And the marshals are running at the back of my car and I take off. Right. Like, I mean, just, it sounds bad. It sounds very dramatic, but you know, I was pulling out anyway. So they missed me there. So I was really in a spot where I was terrified. Like I was like, this is twice I've been arrested. I've been chased. Yeah. So I call, I end up calling the FBI. I call, I called home, talked to some friends. You know, I got a, I got a drop phone, a track phone. Sure. And you know, so I, I, I call home. There's a couple, one of my friends said, look, they, they're, they're talking to everybody, bro. Like you need to talk to this person. You need to call the FBI agent. See if you can turn yourself in. So I called the FBI agent. See if I can talk, turn myself yeah. in. She and I have, we have words. She was not a, a nice person. I mean, really honestly, like, like she would have gotten so much further with me if she'd been polite. But she was just, I mean, honestly, I don't. What, what was she telling you? Just, you better turn yourself in or we're going to make oh, her. It life. was, you know, she was, she was, listen, I was super arrogant back then, more so than now. And she, and, and, and keep in mind, I just ditched two attempts to grab me. So I'm feeling, although I'm feeling semi-insecure, I'm also feeling, you know, there's, there's a combination of cocky in there. 
And I remember one of the things she was saying, she's like, look, you, you need to turn yourself in. And she's like, I remember she said, she said, she goes, you, you understand? She goes, we're about 90%. You know, she goes, she she kept calling me sweetie. She's like, listen, sweetie. She's, you're going to get caught eventually. She goes, you understand? We will catch you. And I go, well, well, what's taking you so long? I said, I mean, if you're going to catch me, like what's taking you so long? And she said, listen, we're, you don't seem to understand. We're about 90% sure of where you are, sweetie. And I go, well, that's only a hundred percent counts. Yeah, and she went and she's like, you're going to fuck up. You're going to, somebody's going to recognize you. You'll come back to Tampa. Somebody will turn you in. You're going to get pulled over. You're, and I said, listen, let, let me, let, let me, let me clear this up for you. I said, I've had two dozen driver's licenses in other people's names. I just came, I, I've been, I, I've got multiple passports. I said, I just went to traffic school as somebody else. I said, I've had multiple plastic surgeries. I said, there's nobody in Tampa I want to see. Yeah, I, said, so, it, I said, nobody's going to recognize me. Yeah, you, you need your you need your prints taken. That's what you need. Right. So I was like, so you're not, if you, unless you want to have this conversation in person, you know, you we need to figure out what I'm looking at. So yeah, she should have, I think she should approach it a little differently. I, I think as a negotiator, let's say this is like a negotiator situation. Right. This is where you negotiate. Yeah, no, she was very just, 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 you know, it's obnoxious. Like, Listen, you at know, one, what? I do a lot like that too, Matt. Yeah, at at one like point, that. let me put it this way. I, I've spoken with multiple FBI agents that work with her and every one of them said she's an issue. Like every one of them was like, oh, you dealt with Candace? Oh, wow. Like all of them are like that. Wow. Really? How'd that go? And they start laughing. You're like, like, I'm not saying she's a problem. They're telling me immediately like, wow, that must've been harsh. And they told you after they arrested you. Oh yeah. This was years later when they would come see me at the, at the prison. So, so what's funny about that is this, is that I remember when we were talking and I, I, I was at the point where she had me convinced I was going to get seven years. And I was still trying, I figured I could get it down to four or five years because okay. I figured if you're staying seven years out of the gate, I can probably negotiate that down. As we're going back and forth, she was like, well, you got to come back to come back to Florida and I can, I'll, I'll let you spend a couple hours with your parents. You can see your son. I, I'll arrange it with your ex-wife to let you, you know, we'll let you hang out, spend some time with them. And she's doing this whole thing. And I said to her, I said, well, listen, my fear is right now I'm driving a car that I know the FBI is looking for, you know, they know that, that they have the tag number. I, I've got, a, I'm driving on a driver's license. If I get pulled over, like you guys are looking for this driver's license right now. It was Gary Sullivan. So I said, listen, I said, my problem is I'm closer to Atlanta. Why don't I just turn myself in at, in, at Atlanta? And she goes, no, 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 don't, you have to come to Tampa, Florida. He, I, wait, wait, just, wait, just wait a second. You, you want to turn yourself in? What the heck? What's going on here? So here was the, no sense. What I found out later was. The Secret Service was in charge of my case in Atlanta and South Carolina. She wanted me to come to the FBI building in Tampa. The, the other thing was, after they caught me and they were investigating me, right, The I, all my cases were consolidated in Atlanta. Well, the FBI, it took them six months before they would send anything Yeah. To the to Atlanta, they requested it three different times, and they ignored the request. Finally, the U.S. attorney had to call the other U.S. attorney, who then had to call the agents and say, "You have to send the discovery." It's unbelievable. They never compiled my discovery because once they said, "Oh, well, the Secret Service grabbed them," it's not our responsibility to compile the discovery. That's their problem. So you, they need to send people down here, or they oh. need to. It was a whole, and, and what happened was my attorney told me, well, you have to understand there's kind of a rivalry between oh, the FBI is. and other agencies. And I so, yeah, yeah, so so your your whole, there's a rivalry. It's like, I sad think at Parkland, it's sad doing D.C. Sniper, it's sad doing Oklahoma bombing, it's sad doing Waco. It, it's just case after case after case. I mean, individually, I know guys outside of work, which is good. Right. When you put in that culture. The supervisors, the ASACs, the SACs demand control and they want to run things. And it doesn't sit well when this is your case. I say, you want to take over a Secret Service case? You want to take an ATF over? No. I mean, we're separate. You know, agents, they, a, lot, a lot of times, at any angle with a T, terrorism, oh, now we have jurisdiction over this case. We, we have to take it over. So they always try to find an angle with a big T in there, right? But don't they always want the high profile cases? They, they always want the publicity. They always they want do. to be able to say, 
we're the ones that broke the case. We're the premier law enforcement agency. That's what I mind. But, you know, like I said, the VEC is going to end all that. <laughs> Rama Swami. I mean, Rama Swami is going to end the FBI. Is that the first thing he's going to do? And think about it. If it goes wrong and they took it over from the ATF or Secret Service, they can always blame the they slip won't. up sure. on the other. Well, we got to keep in mind, we took it over from another agency that wasn't quite doing what the correct Waco. thing. Is it Waco a perfect example? Well, what about Ruby Ridge? Yeah. Well, that that's also that was with the, the marshal getting killed out the ATF warrant. The marshal gets shot out there. I mean, it's 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 a whole thing. Everybody wants to blame everybody else. Everybody points a finger that way, right? Right. It's like, no, no, that's that's not what they they're they're also a nickname for them, famous but incompetent. You know, a lot of people right. that too. So that's out there. Unfortunately, that's the rivalry within, and that's I think anywhere, but sometimes worse in, in law enforcement, especially in the Fed level. And sometimes you have the rivalry with the Feds and the locals too. You know, you have that going on too. So it's uh, a lot a lot of things going on right there. I think we talked about that one situation, a standoff between the ATF agent being tased out there and, and arrested by Columbus Police Department. <laughs> they haven't seen that video. I've seen it. I love that video. I, yeah. I Here's what kills me. The moment he gets the cuffs put on him, he says everything that every single defendant in cuffs has ever said. Oh, can't wait, breathe. wait, I have a heart. I have a heart problem. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I, I have a heart problem. Wait, you don't understand. You know, it's like, what are you doing, bro? Like, honestly... You could have simply just come up right away and said, yo, bro. Okay. Hey, hey, hey. Boom. Now, you know, here's my badge. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm going to cuff you. No problem. I get it. I, I told you I went through something like that before. Remember one of the other shows? Can you explain. Right. And, and, and I just kept it. I and I said, okay. And then after they verified who I was, I just kept my hands up. They put their hands in their pocket. They saw my identification. I didn't have to be thrown down. And then they said, okay, because I was dressed plain clothes. And I'll talk to an FFL, but I did present myself the, to the, the dealer and said, we went back and, and they said, no, he is ATF agent. You know, you don't say he's impersonating anything. You know, it, it's it's one of the things you have to do things a certain way. But the thing I don't like about what happens once they see his ID after he's been tased, why do they drag him to the uh, the mark unit, right? Why is his head getting banged? Why all, all that stuff is not necessary because remember, he's there on official capacity. Aren't you now interfering in a federal investigation? Right. Well, I don't see, I haven't, I didn't see, I just saw the part where they got him on the, on the ground and he's right. complaining and bitching and moaning. It's yeah. like, you should see what happens after that. I think that's why he sued him. He has a major lawsuit against Columbus police department, by the way, because remember, he's also there for, a, they're also for a federal, he's not like he's on his own time there. Right. He's there to retrieve a, a weapon. So this person has an illegal weapon in the house. So that, that's kind of like, Hey, once you see his identification, why did everything else, why did you do that? Why do you escalate more towards this agent here? Why did you do this, this, and this? Why are you throwing him in the back of the mark field? Why are you cranking the heater on him? Why are you banging his head? Why? I mean, you did that a lot. You see the whole thing. The part yeah, after that, thing. yeah, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. So well, it's I just don't know why he was complaining. Because to me, listen, the moment he, like, look, I, I feel like right away I would have turned around and been like, absolutely, I'll cuff up. Absolutely. No, no of course. Problem. That's what I, I, I've done that. It, it, right. I, I know I'm outgunned, right? And it's not gonna, I can't win this battle. So right. you got to be smart about it. You can't be a hothead. You can't be a say, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Remember yeah. that? I'm not doing that. I don't care. I'm not yeah. doing that. Yeah. I don't think you're I'm not yelling at me. Head. You're don't not. Go it, for your, you're remember, not. remember he says, don't go for your pocket. And he yeah. went to Ghana. <laughs> don't <laughs> tease me, bro. Don't it's like, me. stop struggling. You're resisting. Yeah. You know, like you're not going to win in that scenario. No. So I'm not having an argument with you. And then let's face it. They're, they're, they're human beings, right or wrong. They're human beings. Now they're now they're stressed. Now they're pissed off. Now there's tons of adrenaline. So now what happens? Well, now we start banging you around. Now there's no. <laughs> now we're going to start really giving it to you. You know, yeah. which is wrong. Yeah. But wrong. let's face it. You could you could have de-escalated the situation by saying absolutely, cuff yes. me, no problem. I, I, get I, I I've learned that helps a lot when you're dealing with. You have to de-escalate. If you escalate, mm, things can get out of control. So that's an interesting video. If you haven't seen it, folks. Take a look at it. It's it's been out for almost two years now. Uh, it's in litigation now. Uh, I'm not sure if the officers have been suspended or not, but uh, you know, I mean, that's that's a bad situation there. And then of course, you know, you, you've seen the one that happened in Memphis. You saw that video, right? Where that uh, poor guy Terry, what's his last name? I, I did a video on his name right now. I can't remember his last name. Where he's getting pretty much he, he's killed pretty much at the scene in, by Memphis. The whole department is under investigation. Terry Nichols? No, not Terry Nichols. Terry, I, I, I'll give you the name. And you know, take a look at that one. 
It's awful, awful video. I'll send it to you. You can take a look at that. So Terry Nichols was Oklahoma City. No, Oklahoma. It's, he's Terry something. I forget his last name right now. And it's awful. It happened a few months ago. And uh, the whole department, they found more stuff going on. He, he's pretty much just getting, you know, pull, he's just pulled over and they escalate saying he has nothing going on. He, he gets away from them. And all of a sudden, dude, they give him such a beat down that he dies in the hospital a few hours later. Mm. That, that, it's ugly, ugly, ugly. So unfortunately, it's, it's a tough job, but you have to have people who are measured and people know not to take it personal. I said, well, I, I think I did. You have to be a professional. Don't ever take it personal. Your job is to put them away. It's not personal. And I remember that. Oh, listen, I, I you know, you know how many times I'll see these guys, cops pulling somebody over, you know, it, and it, they're so aggressive. It's like, wow, you shouldn't be a police officer. Like, I'm sorry, you pulled this guy over and he didn't pull over fast enough yeah. because he waited, waited about, you know, a mile till he could pull onto a side road because he didn't want to pull off the main yeah. highway. So he pulled off. And I get it. He should have pulled over quicker, but he didn't try and outrun you. Okay. You know, he just went down and pulled off the exit or he, whatever. Well, I didn't want to, you know, he's being very polite and you're, give me your license. Give me, bro, you shouldn't be a drop. You, you, you shouldn't be a cop. That's out of control. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, you have to be prepared to escalate when, when appropriate. You also have to deescalate and some, and some guys can't deescalate and, and, and it takes a certain, a right kind of person has, who ha also has, a passion and vocation. I had a passion to put away, make good cases on the worst of the worst of society, right? And, and that gave me the best gratification at the end when I did the cases, when I bought the dope and the guns and in their area and did it in you know Spanish, English, what, whatever, gang members, non-gang members, traffickers. And I, I gave them 15, 20, 30 years. I felt real good about that. And right. it's, it's hard to match that. And you have to come in with a passion that you're going to come with obstacles. Yeah. Management. You, you've heard my book in Audible. You yeah. saw some of the stuff I had to deal with, right? You, you you have to be able to overcome obstacles like anything in life. I hope that's what they learned from my book is life's lesson. You have to be able to overcome. You have to deal with things. You can't just throw your hands and say, oh, that's it. I quit. No. You, life is difficult. You got to work hard and, and overcome and, 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 and adapt and do things because if not, that's what they want. Some people want to break you. You got to understand that. And you can't let them break you. You never, never always stand up to a bully. Never let the bully win ever. That's my message. Yeah, well, you know, people have issues. That's for sure. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of people with lots of issues. That's, that's It's human nature, unfortunately. That's human nature. Oh, I had a guy who was a First Amendment auditor on the other day. I interviewed him. It was good. And they've got a guy called the Armed Fisherman. Have you seen this guy? No. So he takes his AR-15 fishing in Florida. Oh, you see that? I want to see that. And, yeah. and videos. And keep in mind, you're allowed to. So he's wa he's traps up and he he parks his car and he walks down and the police show up. Like he's like, every time the police show up. So I'm okay. supposed to interview him. And of course they show up and sometimes they just pull up. They're like, hey, what's going on? We got a call. You're freaking people out. He's like, well, I mean, sorry, man. I'm allowed to do this. They're like, I know. We just wanted to let you know we got some calls. And they leave. Sometimes they pull up, they pull their guns out, get on the ground, get on the ground. Why? For a constitutionally protected, you know, uh, act. Like, why am I getting on the ground? I mean, I, it's sitting on the side or it's strapped over me. I'm fishing. You can see I'm fishing. I got a pole, you know? So he goes through all of these things. And I was talking with the guy that I interviewed and he talks about all these times he gets, you know, they get arrested, they get arrested, they video it. Even though the whole time they're like, well, why are you questioning me? I'm not, I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to mm -hmm. video this. I'm allowed mm -hmm. to. And, and he's, the nice thing I liked about the guy I interviewed was he was super polite. Like, I don't, I like it when they're polite, even though everybody else is being a jerk, but they're just overly polite. Like, I'm you talking about the, the police officer? No, no. The guy, the, the constitutional, the first oh, amendment. Oh yeah. I've seen those guys. Yeah. Now I don't like when they're assholes to the yeah. police. Sure, like, I like that either. Okay, you're being an asshole. Like, I, I, I'm with you before. I'm with you. I'm in a post office or I'm downtown in the courthouse. I'm, I'm allowed. And they're, they're recording, right? They're yeah, recording. they're recording. Yeah. I'm allowed to record. I'm allowed to be here. Yeah. Well, I need a driver's license. I'm not going to give you my driver's license. You know, like, I'm, I'm just following what the Constitution says. So, and they're polite. Like, those guys are, I'm okay with. 
the guys I'm not okay with the guys who are like they start calling them the cops' names, they're assholes. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, you end up getting a good beat down. That's for well, sure. And, well, he, here's here's the thing too. Like there was two cops that literally on camera they say, "Well, let me tell you something. Ten years ago, I'd have beaten that dude." Like they start talking about that. It's like that's not good. Well, what happens is you understand these guys they do this, and a lot of people are like, "Why are they doing that?" Look. Not everybody, I'm sure, is this is the reason. But the guy I was talking to, he was saying, look, there's a lot of guys. They want to get arrested. They want the cops to violate their rights sure, because sure. they file a lawsuit. Sure. They file a lawsuit for whatever, $100,000, $200,000. They, they settle for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. These guys, some of these guys have sued 30, 40, 50 times. They're, they're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year getting five and ten thousand dollars a lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those videos. They they do get a little nasty sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't turn out well for them. I don't know what's the conclusion at the end, but you know that's a tough way to want to make extra money because you know it, it's like some of these guys who, who want to antagonize the gangsters. Have you seen the guys who go out there in these videos and say, "Hey, boy, you you looking to get capped, bro? You, you're looking to get what whatever zipped or whatever, you know? Because you're gonna it's, it's a gag. They're gonna say yeah, zip, you know. I, he shows them something else, but these are hard. They go to the hardcore. Have you seen these guys? No. You haven't seen them? Uh-oh. Oh my you got to send me one. Yeah, I'll say these guys are, they're, they're killing it with subscribers. They're, they have millions of subscribers. One of the guys showed how big a house they live in now. I mean, they have a video of how well they've done. But, bro, it's just a video, bro. We can be, the guys, these, I mean, these guys pull out these guns and everything. And, and they're recorded from different locations. And these are hardcore gangsters. You go in the hood just to fuck with them. Right. right. And But it's, it's they have no intention. But these guys snap. And bro, they sometimes they pull their guns on them. They chase them. They want to beat their hand. Bro, it's a video, bro. And the guy's running. It's a video. And it, 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 I think I did. I saw one where they video a guy, and the ga- guy comes up and he starts yelling at him. And you better give me your phone and give give me that camera. You can't have my image. And he starts screaming at him. He's yeah. like, "Touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me." Pulls out Mace, and Mace is the guy. I've seen that one. I've seen yeah, that. yeah. And the guy's like, ah! yeah. he's running That's around it. screaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, these guys don't Mace because they just they're, they're quick. And they're, and they, when the guy's talking. Run. Some of the guys do get caught, and the other guys in, in, in the group has to help them. They say, bro, it's just a video, man. Let him go. Let him go, right. man. It's a little, it's, oh, I don't want you guys. Yeah, I don't care. It's a video. It's a prank, bro. It's a prank. It's a prank, man. And, and the, the, the video, because these are hardcore gang. They go on the road, right. and they, they tat him up. And sometimes he throws fake signs at them. He comes up to them like this and starts doing that to them. Dude, these guys blow up. They blow up. They, what are you you're doing? What do you think you're doing? You, you know it. I feel, I mean, it gets out of control. You you do understand that the guys that are doing this are not like road scholars, right? Like <laughs> you, you don't decide to do something like this because you've been successful in every other facet of no. your life. These are typically guys that have they've been in trouble. They they can't put anything together. They're just yeah. not able to work a regular job and they think, you know what, let me grab my iPhone and see if I can try. I wonder if this will go viral. They start yeah. doing stuff, they get a little bit of traction, and they say, Hey, I'm making this my career. That's it. But well, well, one day they're gonna get killed yeah. because because one of the, because a lot of these YouTubers have you noticed that they are getting killed a lot. Yeah. How about that guy? He was a YouTuber, but he also did investments in Argentina. I can't remember his name right now, but he had a Ferrari. He did the, the videos and everything else. They said he was involved in shady things, and his body was discovered dismembered in a suitcase. No, I didn't know that. I'll send you that one too. We'll talk. That's it's unbelievable. Some of these guys get cut up. It's really messed up things. So, and all these guys, they, they pull out a lot of guns on them. So, you know, ATF agent, I'm looking at a different perspective, of course, as this. I'm not looking, oh, what if I said, you know, I can identify what kind of weapon this is. If you can identify what this guy is, then, hey, that's a case. because He's a convicted felon and he's right. pulling out that weapon. Hey, you can put him away for jail. And I've done that before based on videos and pictures, uh, especially on Facebook and other social media platforms. These guys like to pose with guns and stuff. I've done gangsters like that, too, where you look at and you identify the weapon and you get them. So- Right. I'm looking at that angle, but I'm retired now, so not anymore. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about was these guys that they they start these, you know, they start these channels and they they have to keep getting the views and getting the views and and so they just get keep keep getting more and more reckless and then they end up the, and you you know, sometimes it's like re- remember the guy, there was a guy that he used to video himself. He's one of these skydiver guys. Oh yes, he died. And then one day, boom. He died. Yeah, or there was a guy that used to video himself hanging on to buildings. Mm-hmm. One day he he couldn't do it. He slipped and fell and fell to his death. Yeah, like yeah. they keep trying to get more and more extreme, right? 
the, the skydiving suits, right? You talking like they look, they look like the Batman? Yeah, yeah, like like a like a flying squirrel or something. Those squirrels. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that guy. He, one of them died. Yeah, yeah. That, that happened a few few years ago. Those are dangerous things to be doing. I mean, people love to see the videos and you watch them and all that, but it does come with a price. And some guys are just goofy too. I mean, you have one guy who has like a bag of chips. He has a water gun inside and has a hole in the bottom, right? And he starts squirting people in the area, and and he just plays like in his chips. It's like, is it raining? And people, you see all these views, and people just start looking around. It keeps on doing it over and over. People can't figure out if the dude next to you who has a water gun and, a, right. and a, that looks like an empty bag of chips, and he has a hole in the bottom, and he's squirting you the whole time, and you don't know it. <laughs> sure. What about the guy who dresses up like the plant? He he acts like he's a plant. Oh yeah, I've seen he's like a big out. like a bush, and then if people walk by, he goes bah, and they. Like, um, before, hey, before I get involved in all this, I never watch this stuff. By the way, I'm retired. I can watch this stuff. I write about it and I enjoy it because I'm on like you on all these shows. So I find it interesting stuff. And I'm doing also a weekly show now with my our buddy William Steele. I know he's gonna right. come back on your show soon, he says. Maybe in person he's gonna try. I don't know. Yeah, if he's in the area. Yeah. He actually did pretty pretty well. You know, he he's he's funny. I get these guys now before before they come on. You know, my booking agent. He, he tells people nothing. He's like, hey, this guy's got 150,000 or I represent Matt Cox, Inside True Crime. He's got 150,000 subscribers. He gets more than 2 million down, you know, 2 million. I think he says downloads, but it's views. It's downloads. like two point, you know, yeah, over I, two. I, I refer Bill to, to you though, because I did the show with you. Right. So, but I'm saying, so here's the problem is that that's all, all my booking agent says. So then it's up to me. And, the, and then he says, oh, we can promote your book. We can, like, he's trying to get them on. And then they're like, yeah. And then they come on. And so I had multiple people who essentially, it's like you were scamming banks, let's say, or let's say you were, you were a bank robber okay. and then you got out and you went to jail for 10 years and you got out and now you're, you know, whatever, you're trying to change the law or whatever. And they get on and that's all they want to talk about is like, well, now what I do. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I run a true crime channel. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about crimes. Yeah. So now I have to give everybody a talk where it's, listen, I need you to tell me why you went to jail. Not, well, yeah, I robbed 10 banks and then I got to prison and you rightfully so I got 10 years. But now what I do, no, no, that's yeah. not, that's not. Tell the story. How, how you? Are. That's interesting. Right. People oh, want yeah. to hear that. So we're going to talk about that for about an hour. And then if you want to talk for an hour about what you're doing now, that's great. Yeah. But you don't get to get everything you want. <laughs> and I get five minutes of the setup. See, I, I, that's one thing with me. I've done, I think, four shows with you now, right? Right. And we do it. I love telling these true crime stories. Right. Once I research, once I live, I mean, I, I'm about telling the stories. I, I, I really enjoy that. And I think my book's about that too. I mean, I don't think anybody really wants to go to True Crime Channel to listen to a guy who's reformed, allegedly reformed, because a lot of guys are not. Yeah. I'm telling well, them they're, they're doing something. Hey, I'm going to have this racket going on. Mm, that sounds like a racket. I want to hear how, how how come you shot so-and-so? Why did you go through the door? How come you were the get No, no, I want to hear all that. Right. Were you scared? Had you shot a gun before? Yeah. Who gave you the gun? Were you, yeah. you know, like it, when William Steele, I had to, I, I, I think he and I had that talk before. Oh, no. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. But listen, he was great. He's a good storyteller. We did all he, stories. He was. He went slowly through every piece of how the it, it built up, and you know he went through every single piece of it. I, I like the story he tells about how he didn't know what Nick Navarro, Nick, Nick Navarro's house, the sheriff of Broward County. Yeah, yeah. The bad the police, bad boys sheriff. Yes, right? and, and he, he didn't know it was his house, and he cleaned him out. And allegedly, he said he found some inside the house too. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's it. I, I, I remember we done a lot of shows together. That's it. That's that's what we talked about. But that's all out there. So we're gonna the thing with uh, was it Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan had he Ronald found Reagan. a plaque or something? Yes, he did for, for having the task force and everything else going on. But the interesting part I thought was he found some blow in there. Okay. That's that's that that's interesting too. So it was just evidence. He was just holding evidence. It. He holding forgot. I, I don't know, but that's baggy. what he says. That's his stories. Yeah. And I, I find this, I'll, I'll tell some of his stories too. I don't care because we do so many shows together and uh, we're doing Steal the Spotlight every Saturday night at 8 p.m. So right. if you like listening to me, you like listening to him, you know, I will invite you one day and do that. You can join us live one day. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. No problem. Yeah. Well, we love to tell a story. Uh, How is it, his channel doing? 
good. I mean, we, we, I mean, like I said, it's it's two thousand subscribers. Yeah, it's it's you know, it, you have to go on other people's channels. Yes, really, kind of. I, I would say I would say, call it conscripting. You know, you have to conscript their subscribers. He 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 and I in the last show, you should guys should see it. We were talking politics also, like we were at the beginning. And Bill says he's contemplating running for the Oval Office in 2028. Can you imagine? Like that alone, he'd get 100,000 subscribers. <laughs> and I'd say, well, that's good, Bill, because I'm considering to run in 2024 for Congress. I think I, I mentioned before, I guess, Abigail Spanberger, who, who's in District 7 here. And so I'm, I'm still debating it. Liberal Democrat, you know, I was gerrymandered. I was a conservative Republican district. They put me in her district. And I'm not very happy with her at all. I mean, you know, she was a former, allegedly CIA officer, and also she was a postal inspector. And of course, my background law for 26 years, but her policy, she wants a sole weapons ban. They haven't secured the border. There's higher taxes. They have protection for illegals. I mean, everything that I'm against, I'm pro-life. She's pro-choice. I mean, it's everything that I think is a very conservative area. And I think there needs to be a change. And she's been there already three terms. I think it may be a time for a different one. So I'm, I'm really considering it hard and you know, we'll see Matt if I decide to run against her. Let me know. Yeah. I'll let you know, man. We'll do a show on it. Did that book come out that I helped you a little bit consulting about task force and that has that come out? I hate to tell you this. What's that? <laughs> I, so I, I don't know. Nobody said, no way that it's not a big deal. I had to, so I pitched that story to Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. And the the guy I'm working with, the editor I'm working with, you know, I I had, I told him, look, I, I interviewed, you know, an ATF agent and he goes, was he on the task force? And I went, no, but but he explains how it works oh, and, I and how, know. and he goes, he said, yeah, you're going to have to inter- interview somebody that was on the task no, okay. force. And I was like, oh man. So I ended up interviewing the sheriff and the head of the task force in Okeechobee. Okay. I, but as a result, I also ended up interviewing the U.S. attorney or the assistant U.S. attorney on the case. And then I, you know, that kind of sparked a whole thing. I ended up interviewing a couple of the, of her, of her co-defendants. So, so, you know, I put together kind of an article. Will it make, will it end up in Rolling Stone? They said it would they oh, cool. in an agreement. Awesome. So your version probably will not end up being the version um, although she's saying she wants to write like a memoir, and if that's the case, then then it probably will end up. Then I'll probably she'll probably have to come back to you and and actually interview you. Oh sure, um, well, whatever that'll be great though. Yeah, it, it it's good. It, it it's a good story. I'm, we'll see. We'll see if it makes Rolling Stone. That'd be great. I would love to do that. I love to be able to say I I I'm a writer for Rolling Stone magazine. Like I think yeah. that would open up some doors. Yeah, let me know if they want to talk about my experiences with ATF undercover and all, all the harrowing stories. Also, I would love to do a little thing with them. Baby steps. Let Baby me steps. let me get in I, first. I know. I guess you there. Just like just like with a script to have done with based on ATF on take down the kings, take down the king. Actually, I would love to be able to get that to a TV series. I think it'd be a good TV series. The script is good. The pilot's good. I like to see where else. I'm looking for different companies looking at it. But you know, the writer strike has really put a damper on things. So, right. How that is. Listen, I, somebody sent me a video the other day about that AI had written a 10 minute video about, about aliens arriving Mm. on the planet and AI had written the whole script. So it was about aliens arriving at, on the planet. So so it, AI had written an entire script. Mm -hmm. It had directed the entire script. It had pulled B-roll for the whole thing. It had all the quotes from the president, multiple presidents, and Putin and Biden and all of these, all of these political party officials. It did the voices in their voice for yeah. the for the quotes of them talking. And it's ten minutes, and it's amazing. You look at it and you're like, and it tell it, the guy explains what the description was like. This is all I told it to do. And this is what it came up with. It is amazing. And you saw it on YouTube? Yeah. I Well, I, I, I don't know if it was YouTube or... See, it may have been TikTok. I know you don't like TikTok. I don't like TikTok. 
I could, if it's, if it's not, if it's on TikTok, I won't send it to you. But if it's, but if it's, if it's YouTube, I'll send it to you. It was, listen, it was. I'll, 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 I'll do some, maybe it's another platform too. A lot of times they put up multiple platforms. Well, I'll send it to you. You can try and find it. I'm sure it's on, it's probably on, on YouTube somewhere. Or Rumble or something. Uh, people like it. I know you don't use Rumble, but I, I've been getting very popular with Bill on Rumble too. Sometimes our shows do a lot better on Rumble than they do on YouTube. Well, I mean, I think Rumble is probably a more conservative platform. Yeah. Yeah. You and know? they like what we're saying. And so listen, I think if they were paying, if Rumble paid better, if Rumble was identically uh, identical to YouTube in the, the your ability to upload, to write descriptions, to the whole thing, I, I would be pumping a ton of stuff on Rumble. But at this point, you have to do like one live show a week or something to get some more, at least one live a week. I don't know. It's, it's some strange rules in there. You're right. That's what some people are telling me about it. But you know what? It's all about also getting the books and exposure. I think it'll still help you. So I think because you know you, you seem some of your books are pretty interesting. True crime is Rumble likes that stuff. I think it'll help you sell a lot of books too. I'm not sure how they're doing, but you know, can't hurt. I should probably try it. Just try and start uploading stuff and see what happens. Put our shows in there. You see how how it happens because I'm getting popular on Rumble, so it just feeds on that. Hate to have to figure out another platform, <laughs> dude. They never stop. Bro, there's never stopping. Odyssey's and other ones out there. I mean, it's just never stopping. They just keep on growing, growing, growing. I don't like Instagram, by the way, either. Yeah, I like writing. I, I have stuff on, yeah, but I have stuff on. My Instagram account has like over 80,000 followers. TikTok, okay. I'm actually going to have to start another TikTok account because the guy that started my TikTok account was in Canada. So I have a Canadian TikTok account hmm. that cannot get monetized. Oh. Cool. Oh. So um, we we have to start a whole new TikTok. We just started a Facebook. You know, oh, you didn't have Facebook. No, I mean I had a personal Facebook, but you didn't have a one for. I've had one for for this for you for a while now. No, I just we just started. It's already got like thirteen thousand uh, followers. Wow, that's a lot we worked with a company called a Jelly Smack, and they're they're handling the Facebook, and they're probably going to open one up for us for for TikTok also. And, and they they're big on mon- getting it monetized and paying for advertising. And you got to pay for all that, right? Well, they they pay for everything. Just a partner with me, they're putting up the money. Oh, they're paying to go with you. Yeah. Oh. Now we split everything, but they oh, yeah. invest something like I twenty guess. something th- twenty twenty five thousand th- uh, dollars in advertisement over the first couple of years. So. And listen, they got 13,000 subscribers within about two months. That's good. And we don't have to do anything. They're pulling our stuff off of YouTube and just repurposing it. So I don't have to do not. We don't have to do anything. Cool. No, no. Um, that works out good. I need to get I this. I feed up. You got, I try to get more ideas since I'm near all this myself, just like Bill is. And, uh, you know, we're growing. We're doing the shows where I'm doing a lot of books. I did learn pretty quickly. I use Kindle. If you're, if you're a writer out there like Matt and I are, and like Bill, if you want to, you're tired of the publishing company holding you back. You want to do the workaround. Go sell publishing Kindle, man. And put your stuff out there and let people read it. And then go Kindle Unlimited and it and it advertises it for you on Amazon. And it really grows. You get a lesser percentage, but it, it's I mean I, I get thousands of pages read yeah. all the time. So it's it's pretty cool that way. So and then I get more popular, more popular, and it's uh, it's done well. So I really enjoyed that part. Now I just got to keep on. Now I'm doing scripts and everything else and. Let's see if it gets picked up by TV series or what have you. It looks like Rolling Stone is pretty cool. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'm hoping, hoping it, it I, you know, I sent my first draft. I haven't heard anything back yet. I'm just hoping to get, if it, if it gets in there, I think it's got a great, cause it, it, it's a, it's a phenomenal story. I thought it was a great story. It's a great story. Yeah. So, I mean, and some of my books are, how many words is it? What do you mean? Your, your, your draft you just did now, how many words? Oh, 8,000. 8, it was like 8,000 8, words. A lot of my, my stories are about that. So I could always send one of my, I, I think the one I did, I don't know if I told you about this one. If you want to keep on going, I can tell you a quick little story here. Okay. On keep Alaska. Going. I said, the Alaska, the land of the midnight sun. I, right. I, I wrote this one. This is this is the prequel to me becoming an agent, right? This is a true story, by the way. This is a true story. I did a prequel. I was in, just graduated from college, St. Louis University in Pasco, right? Catholic University up there in St. Leo, near San Antonio, all right? Not summer of 93, a buddy and I <clears throat> are going to uh, go do our Alaskan adventure. You know, a lot of people love to go to Alaska and, and go on a big adventure. So I'm, no. I'm looking, and this is before this is before the internet. It's the summertime. So I have to do old school. You know, th- this is old school. You have a magazine, right? You got information. You got to call people. 
you know, you got to call and find out, hey, listen, I know you have positions here. We're going to work at a cannery. We're going to work at a fishing cannery. The goal is to work, and this is before the show became pop popular with Dangerous Catch. Remember that? You go on the crab vessels, yeah. you, you get a percentage of the catch where you could make, I mean, for that time, easily on, on one trip, make about 10, 15,000, maybe more, depending how much you guys catch and all that. So that was our plan. I said, just graduate from college. We're going to go out to Alaska. We're going to camp out and we're going to have a blast making a ton of money, spending nothing. I disagree, but well, go ahead. What happened? I'll what happens. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, we, we get all the camping gear. We go to, uh, I know you're familiar, maybe familiar with Tampa a little bit. There used to be in downtown Tampa, an old U.S. Army Navy store, surplus store, and famous, been there for 50 years, just recently closed. I saw the video, and the guy was so nice to us. He helped us to get all the gear we needed. Oh, in Tampa, there was one you said? Yeah, downtown yeah, okay, Tampa. Okay, okay. I know. I've been there. You've been there, right? It's famous. It's not there anymore? Not anymore. No, but there's one on Bears Avenue now. There's still okay. one around, but there, there, one in, there was one in Tampa. Yeah, downtown Tampa, the one downtown Tampa, no mas, right? That one, they had to even have big special. If you want to Google that and take a look on YouTube, you can see the video. And the guy was a little emotional, but he said, you know what? It's been time, it's been a long time and what have you. But the same guy, I remember, 93, helped us to get, we got an army pop-up tent. We ended up getting really good fleecing sleeping bags because even in Alaska, it gets hot and during the day, it gets cool at night. It's still in the 50s and, I, and I'm, you know, I want to be you know, warmer and I don't want to be suffering. So- and we, we fly out there. My mom works for the airline industry and I'm able to get uh, standby. You know, if you fly standby, right, you don't pay anything for the tickets, right? You go on there. So I flew from Tampa to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage. So we have all our gear, camping and all that. I already made the plans and I knew exactly where we're going to go in Kiski. Hey, have you been to Alaska? No. Oh, what a, what a beautiful state, man. It I have to like go back. Freezing. To Everything I ever see is freezing. No, not, not, this, not in wintertime. I'm talking about in the summer where it's gorgeous. The weather is not freezing in the summer. It is warm. It was warm. The day is up in the 80s and even in the 50s at night, which is gorgeous weather, by the way. Uh, amazing right. weather. So we go out there. We stay at a, a youth hostel the first time in Anchorage. And it's pretty much like $10, pay nothing, open beds. You had a bathroom shower. We can do all that stuff. <clears throat> so we go to Anchorage and we start talking to people in the area. They say, what do you think of this cannery? We're going to work in here. You're hearing all the stories. What do you think of working this vessel? Oh, I want to work here. So we're going to Kiski. I goes, oh, that's good. I said, yeah, it's, it's owned half by Japanese and half by Americans because the Japanese love their salmon. And that's huge. We have the red salmon and you have the pink salmon, right? So, and I didn't know much about the salmon, but I will learn a lot about fish when I get out there. Remember, I graduated from St. Leo. I have a degree in political science and history, right? But this is going to be the hardest work of my life. It is intense. If freezing conditions in these canneries, it is cold. And the, what I'm doing is, so we, we camped out there. We, we got all the gear. And most three kinds of people that are camping out there in, 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 in the Kenai Peninsula, in that area. You had college students, migrant workers, and a lot of people who didn't want to be found. A lot of fugitives, outlaws. Right. A lot of outlaws in Alaska. We'll bump into a lot of outlaws. I'm going to tell you some stories. My, my prequel before was law enforcement. So, <clears throat> so we're camping. It's open. You know, you don't, you can't watch stuff all the time. So Eric and I, my buddy in college, we end up splitting shifts so we can at least protect our stuff. I say, I say the night shift, he did the day shift. And, uh, and that's why it's like, it was like midnight and I'm working. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get, it gets dark briefly just for a little bit around two in the morning, three o'clock and it's daylight again. So have you ever seen the movie with Al Pacino and yeah. amnesia? Insomnia. 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 He, he can't sleep because bad. I, I had the same thing. Man. It's, it's hard because the work is so tiring. Or when I get to the, that little the little uh, tent, I'm exhausted. But the sleeping bag, I'm done because it's 12-hour shifts, freezing conditions. You're spooning the guts out of the fish. It's a semi line. Non-stop. You know, I'm finished college, but I mean so many people. that Some are stacking it. It's freezing conditions there. They give us gloves and, and gear and everything else. But I can almost still feel in my fingers how cold it was in these canneries and working in there. You have little breaks here and there, but by the time you're done, you're, you're exhausted. So you go back in there <clears throat> and we meet a lot of people. Us college kids, we start talking. We meet I mean, people from, from Washington State, from Chicago, but we were the farthest from Florida. I said, man, we don't see a lot of guys from Florida. A lot of them will come in the summers, the college kids, and make this extra money because they're paying us at the time, 93, like $13, $15 an hour. That's not bad. That's right. good money back then. 
and, and we're banking it because it even kind of fed us a little bit in the cafeteria there. It had some food out there. We brought our own food, right? And we, we don't pay for anything. We're camping. So, and, they, and the money goes directly to the account. They set up a bank account. They had even an ATM card from the local bank there in Alaska, which, which is pretty cool. So like I said, remember about the outlaws and guys who are yeah. weird and all that. Right. So we have a lot of downtime sometimes because it all depends. Sometimes there's a big load of fish that came in. We work hard. Downtime, okay, go back to the camp. Everybody's you know, having some beers. A lot of pot. People smoked a lot of weed. It wasn't my thing, but man, people love to smoke weed out there in Alaska. There's a lot of that. <clears throat> so we're talking. And you meet some guys. We were, like I said, 20, 21, right? 21, 22. And there's some guys in their late 30s, 40s. And they're kind of a little strange and out there. And, you know, one of the guys we we're talking with was saying, hey, I'm trying to restart my life. I'm working at Canada. But his story doesn't make sense, right? It's kind of weird. And once he starts drinking more and he gets a little bit stranger, a little bit louder, right? Starts he, talking about the bodies that he buried. Yeah. Yeah. He, he has a revolver. He has a stainless a revolver. And he starts showing us some of the college guys. He said, hey, I want to shoot it. Let's go in the woods here. And he starts shooting it. I'm saying, hey, you got to be careful. You know what's over there. But he pops rounds like nothing said, man, you got to be careful, but not be doing that. You don't know who's out there. We already know this guy's a problem. So one day we're, and I, you know, a lot of us like to talk and we're around a, a, in a campground area talking. It's like four or five of us. And this one particular attractive female, you know, we're talking to whatever he comes up and he looks like he's high, he's drunk, something else. But I know he has the gun on, right? And he, he comes up, up to her and he pokes her with it in her ribs. Or he puts it around her ribs. I said, and she starts crying. She starts freaking out, as you can imagine. I said, bro, don't be doing that, man. What are you doing? Then he points it at me. And I said, hey, man, what, what, what? Then everybody else starts getting on top. Hey, man, put the gun away. There's nobody for that. He gets all upset. He starts yelling, and he goes away. Well, everybody starts reporting him to, uh, this we're part of the camp. They report him to the, the supervisor over there. Say, bro, this guy's out of control. I don't know what's going on. I never saw the guy again. So I, I assume they found him in the gun, and he either had a warrant or he's a felon right. with a firearm, and off he went. Because after that whole incident, the debacle, never saw him again. I said, oh, man, that's that's a, that's the thing of the camp. I put a strike in my head. It's like, oh, I don't like this situation. This was kind of, I'm here to work, and now, and now we have this guy pointing guns, shooting. Almost He freaked her out, poking her. In the, man, that's kind of messed up. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? I mean, she was like in tears. Very attractive young female, and it, it was like you know, traumatized her. I mean, that, right, no one's used to I mean, a, a gun pointing your ribs, right? <laughs> that's, that's not a good feeling. I wasn't. I didn't like having a point in my face or point right at me. I was like, whoa, what are you doing, buddy? So, and there was other, sometimes you have families out there working in the camp, right? <clears throat> and they had a, I would say she was about 16, 17. She was attractive, right? And there were some migrant workers. Now, I don't know if she was or wasn't raped. Allegedly, she said she was raped by the migrant worker at, at this camp, right? Investigators came out and as he said, she said that she had been drinking. Right. She was consenting. So all of a sudden, you see a lot of drama. You see alleged rape going on. Guy shooting fire, poking at people, pointing at your guns. I'm like, man, this is getting out of control here. So my buddy Eric says, hey, man, they say he's got some downtime here. You want to go up to Talkeetna? And that's that's between Mount McKinley. If you haven't seen Mount McKinley, it's the largest mountain range in the North America. It's called the Nali now. And they're having a bluegrass festival. And he said, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to go with some other guys. Okay, you stay. We'll go up there. <clears throat> and we're going to camp out there. But I'm going to sleep in bag. And we're going to camp. And they were playing bluegrass music again. Everybody smoked a lot of weed. Not my thing, but I drank and have a good time and what have had have everything else. And me and my other guys noticed that I said, Man, who's this biker group here? And it's like the Hell's Angels. And I was like, I didn't know much about the Hell's Angels, but I knew that they were guys that, you know, like to uh, ride around Harleys and sometimes they're brawlers, right? Again, melees and everything else. And of course, I'll learn a lot more later with investigations and everything else, but they were doing security for the event. And I'll find out later that Hell's Angels make a lot of money doing security at these kind of events. So we came up to one of the guys and we were talking. And I said, man, I, I see. I was knowing they were doing Toys for Tots. I said, man, that's pretty cool. The fundraising of Toys for Tots. That's good charity. They're helping kids who don't have you know money to get that. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I don't know any better. So the guy, and then we said, hey, you want to get some beer at the local bar right here? So we, we started drinking with a few of these Hell's Angels guys, right? And of course, I don't know much about these guys. So I, I'm asking, I said, hey. That's great that you guys do Toys for Tots and everything else. And they knew our background. We're a college degree. We're going back. I'm maybe going to law school. I'm maybe doing this, what have you. And he goes, Man, you want nothing. This will be in the face. Hell's Angel, something like this. You want nothing to do with these guys. Th th this is all a facade. It's all a bunch of bullshit, right? And all these guys are involved in a lot of bad shit. Right. I believe the Toys for Tots image at all. Yeah, this is just PR for them. Exactly. And, and he was in there and he's telling us that at the bar. I said, right. Okay, good to know. We finished our drinks. 
do I want a drink? I said, all right, Bill, we're out of here. And we went back and <clears throat> we went back to Alaska, kept on working out there in Kenai. And then mom said, listen, we're going to Glasgow or uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. I've been there for a month, month and somewhere. They said, do you want to join us? I mean, it's out there. And I said, well, man, I'm almost done making my money here. I said, that's not a bad way in my summer before I start working. I go from Anchorage to Edinburgh or Glasgow and finish another week, week and a half in Scotland. And I said, buddy, you want to come? You know, you're staying a little longer? He said, yeah, I'm going to stay another week or so. So they dropped me off at the airport and that ended that uh, adventure. I had the land of the midnight sun. <laughs> I wonder what ever happened to that guy. The guy, yeah, he probably did some time. Man. The guy was crazy. I mean, you don't start pointing guns. Especially, you know, these, these are people who are here. Most of them came from good families, good money. Right. No, he, he you know, like, he, listen, did you ever see that movie, Into the Wild? It was similar, right? The guy was or, a little crazy. He got the bus. He dies in the bus. Yeah, yeah. The book. There was a, a book. I read the book when I was in prison. The book's tiny, tiny. But the. the, the you're, you're like mine then. The land of the midnight sun, Alaska. Yeah, but he ends up dead. He yeah. he he died. He made a bad decision there. Yeah, trying. yeah, he ate the wrong berries. He ate the wrong berries, and he didn't realize that the river would be so high when he wanted to go back, remember? Right, right. He got trapped. He got trapped. What I was going to say was- You know, that bus is not there anymore. They finally got no, rid really? of it. They got rid of it. They, they, too many people were hiking, getting hurt, trying to get there. So they had to go in there, pick it up, and get rid of it. Yeah, I, I think Alaska, that's one of those places where people go that have problems and they want to, like you said, they want a new start. They're they're trying to escape. Uh, I, I watched a, a TikTok the, or a short the other day, I think, where the guy said that the internet ruined ruined, he said the, <laughs> ruined it for men. And then the other guy is like, what do you mean? He said, mm-hmm. used to be that if a guy didn't want to be with a woman anymore or his whole family, he'd say, I'm going out for cigarettes and he'd get up and he could go 10 miles away and start a whole new life and be 10 miles away. Oh, wow. And he said, he said, but then the internet came along <laughs> and they can find you anywhere you go. That's right. So I was, I thought that the way he said it was funny. Cause I was like, yeah, you're right. You could be, you could quit your job, change your name, start over again in Italy and a couple hours of research. They're probably going to track you down. Yeah. yeah. One thing I never saw before when I was there at that festival was the Northern Lights. Man, that is impressive to see the Northern Lights at night. Right. Man, that's, that's things I still remember clearly, and it was over 30 years ago. I really had a, had a good time. It's an adventure. It started my, my life of adventures, and it's pretty. If you haven't been to Alaska, now I want to take my family. I've been 30 years, but this time I want to do a cruise, and I want to go out there and, and check it out. And I want to see the humpback whales, and I love nature, so I love to do all that. Keep a distance from the bears, though. Do you remember the uh, the the movie or the the series Northern Light? Nor- was it Northern Lights or no? It was called no. Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure, yeah. The doctor, or yeah, yeah. And it was a former the guy was a former senator trying to create this whole little town. And anyway, I remember they were running a he was running some kind of a whatever it was a hotel or something. And there were all these Japanese that came. And he had like 40 or 50 Japanese that were there. And they were like, wow. And the Northern Lights came out. And all That's they were all couples. They all jumped up and they ran into their room to have sex. Because if you conceived during under the Northern Lights, they believed that their children would be extremely successful. Wow. So I That's an that excuse. Was, yeah, I don't know about that, but it sounds like a fun time. Yeah, no, I'm sure they're, but they're amazing, right? Yeah. And what is that? They're, they're, it's actually something what is it they're like solar flares coming off of the sun that are striking the atmosphere yeah it's, it's beautiful yeah it's scientific if you type it up they'll tell you the whole thing but it is amazing to look at and i never seen it before it starts morning goes, lights it up and you're like what the heck you know you see it's not the same when you see something on a video yeah when you see in person you gotta go see that i mean it's unbelievable stuff out there and i like the people it, it's the, the the motto of alaska is the last frontier and right it, it was then I imagine some way still like that now, but it's a different world out there. It was massive. I, it is the largest state in the country, the largest state. And ha- go check out uh, Denali, Mount McKinley. They, they changed the name. It used to be called Mount McKinley. They changed it to Denali, back to the original name, the big one. The locals, natives call it, you know, it's their, their, their language, Denali. So I would definitely recommend Alaska. Probably Beautiful. not going to do but that. You're not going to sleep. It's hard to sleep, though. I will give you that. In the summertime, in the winter, it's dark most of the day. And the summer is light most of the day. Very different. That's insane. Yeah. All right. Midnight sun. 
<laughs> All right. Listen, I appreciate you coming on the program. Yeah, man. Over two hours is a record for us. That's all I'm, uh, listen, oh, I, I, I keep going. I got another one of these though. Wow. Like an hour. I think, what time is it? No, I think it's at two o'clock. At two o'clock, I have one. Okay. Yeah. Get a little lunch and you're good to go. Yeah. I try and do, I'm trying to do at least one in person a week. And we've been pretty, pretty strong on that. And then three or four stream yards, you sure. know, remote. So yeah. what did that come? But really, I've been doing pretty good. Been doing about four a, a week. Yeah. Well, no, I think we've been doing three. So it, it's a total. It's it's three, three remotes, one in person. And sometimes you tell me you're fifty fifty. Something you get cancellations too, right? Listen, I have to, I have to book like seven a week mm. to get three or four. Oh wow, people, I I just don't I don't understand. People, I'm, I'm solid. Sure. You know, I never. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, a lot of people just, it's like, how did you, you know, like, how are you, how do you function when you contact somebody who a week earlier said, okay, I got you on my schedule, I'll be there. And then you go to, you know, you send, send them the link, nothing happens. Then eventually I call my booking agent or I start texting them or I call them and they're like, oh, is that today? You said you put it on your schedule. But don't you send them like you do with me? I do. Oh, that's great. But then like a, like a, sometimes it'll be the day before, hey man, I got to change schedule. I got I got to change or okay, I you know, every once in a while I get it, but when you got three or four that aren't showing up a week, like how do people function? Yeah. Well, that's like you said, these people have a history of making bad decisions, right? This is true. So, this is what, true. what do you expect? But it's a little different when you get a guy who's retired and a law enforcement, we have to be punctual. You got to be in your game because you don't you can't stick around, but people don't tolerate that. You right. imagine leaving your boss down for a meeting like that? They don't, they're not going to put up with this. So you have to, not only am I punctual, I'm early. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be late. My dad used to say, being on time is being 15 minutes early. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm typically, that's why, I'm really typically, that's why I send the link fif about 15 minutes beforehand. Okay. Because that's I, usually it, when I You know me, I, I'm ready easily 15 minutes ahead of time. I'm already prepped up. I'm ready to go and rock and roll because sometimes we even start earlier. I've done like 100 of these shows too. So folks, if you like this stuff, go check my name out, Matt's name in YouTube or in Google. And man, I've, I've done, and we have the weekly show. Maybe we'll bring Matt on to do it with a steel spotlight and uh, every Saturday night at uh, 8 p.m. Check check it out also. But this is good stuff, man. 40, and you do that live? We pre-record it and it's live. And now we're taking questions, people making comments and we're, we're commenting with them. So that's pretty cool. People have, a lot of, people have interesting questions, especially with me, ATF background and, and Bill with his background. It, it's like both sides of the fence, like you and me, both sides right. of the fence, right? You talk about your side, I talk about my side. Your experience with the FBI was a different side than my experience <laughs> with the FBI, right? My, my stuff and yours is like, hey, listen, I, rather than saying, hey, Matt, you're doing the right thing. This is what I would say. If you called me, I said, I appreciate the phone call, Matt. We don't want anything bad to happen to you. You know, this whole wrestling get ugly. Let's, let's work this out. Turn yourself in. I will definitely let the prosecutor know you decide to turn yourself in and I'll be taken into consideration, Matt. This is the right. best thing you can be doing. Call, and we appreciate you calling this, Matt. This is so important that you do it. So I would walk you down a different path <laughs> than saying, hey, 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 motherfucker, we're going to come and get you and we're going to stomp she, on you. And we're gonna she, in a way, she did that, but in a much more aggressive <laughs> She's like, you don't want to get, you don't want to get, you don't want some, some cop pulling up on you. Uh, uh, it, you could end up getting shot. You could, I'm like, yeah, I noticed that you put on the, on the wanted posters armed and dangerous, dangerous. Oh, man. They that because I had, oh, wow. I had a concealed weapons permit in Florida, but I didn't have a weapon on me. Like I didn't have one. They were like, that, that would definitely get you bullied. Yeah. yeah they're, they're saying like, he's known to carry a weapon. Like I don't have a weapon. And, and, and you were willing to train yourself in Atlanta. No, no, no. I need you in Tampa. No, you need to drive all the way. I, my fear was if I get pulled over, like that's not a little drive. I, I was two, three hours away from Atlanta. I was like nine hours away from Tampa. So it's like me driving the next eight or nine hours. Like there's a good chance I get, I, I was trying to ditch my, my, the vehicle I was in as quick as possible. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be driving around or get pulled over with this ID that I know they're looking for. No, so that's a bad spot. That's the only reason I called. I was in such a bad spot, especially armed and dangerous. Not yeah, that, was just, that was just like, what are you? What are you doing? You're trying to get. You're trying to get me shot. 
Yeah, that, that's that's all I did. I said, you better turn yourself on. But there's a nice way of doing it, and there's not a nice way of doing it. If she was nicer, I bet you probably would have turned yourself in, right? If it would have been like, hey, Matt, I'm talking down. and It's going to be okay. We're going to work out with, with the prosecutor. We're going to talk to the judge. You turn yourself. You save the taxpayers. Because we have a, a marshals. All that stuff plays right. into it. You may you might have got less time, but did you turn? You no, know, you didn't turn. So you got arrested at the end. I got arrested. Hey, I appreciate you guys checking out the video, and if you liked it, do me a favor and share the video. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notified. Please consider joining my Patreon. We're going to put all of retired DEA agent Esteban's links in the description for his books. My Patreon is going to be in the description. You know, I got Instagram. I got Facebook. I have TikTok. We'll leave all of those. The links are in the description also. Really appreciate you guys watching the video. And please consider buying one of my books. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. See ya. Where were you born? Cool. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Los Angeles. In, in California, but raised in South Florida in uh, Miami. <clears throat> and, you know, I've always had some interest in law enforcement, obviously. You know, you grew up in the same times. I, I was born in the, in the 70s, and I grew up when I was younger in the, in the 80s with Miami Vice, right? And I'm in, right. I'm in South Florida, right? How cool is, you're seeing Don Johnson, you know, you're, you're watching the cool cars, the Ferraris, right? You're thinking, man, that, that, that is pretty cool. So that always was, you know, obviously in the back of your head, and you're looking at that, but never thought, I would ever do that kind of work, really. I, I kind of, you know, that was cool, and I like the guns, I like the training, I like putting down these bad guys, and and the cocaine cowboys were were huge back in in the eighties. Well, years later, you know, I go to college. I went actually up not far from where you're at, up to uh, Saint Louis University. It's a Catholic university, and uh, I get my degree in, in political science and in history. Then I come back to uh, FIU in Miami. So now we're looking about the mid nineties. And uh, I get, I'm working my degree in international relations and I was going to go to law school. I accepted to a law school in Lansing, Michigan, Thomas Cooley. And, you know, the farthest thing in my head, but, and I'm seeing the prices, how expensive law school is. And this is mid nineties, a lot more now, obviously, but even in the mid nineties, and I didn't have a, I had a scholarship in college. I played tennis on number one for my school, but it was going to cost me about like about 30,000 a year, right? 30,000 a year, three years at least. You have housing. You got to get your know, loans for all that stuff. And I'm thinking, and I know how competitive is law school. And some people are saying, man, that's a lot of money. But I already have my degree, very athletic. I was good shooting. My dad taught me how to shoot early in life. We'll go to the range. And my dad was a gun. Enthusiast. So I'm competent with a firearm, right? I'm athletic. And I'm thinking, wow. And I noticed internet just started, right? This is 1995. Windows came out. And I didn't use it in college, but I said, man, this is the future, right? So I got myself a computer and I taught myself because this this is people have said, What are you doing? What's what's emailing? What do you do? I got myself a Yahoo account, people a prodigy, right? People had no idea what what the stuff what dial up, what are you what are you doing? And, and it's like, well, this is the future. And people are like, no, I don't think this is gonna last. I think, no, I, I think this is gonna be last. <laughs> Listen, I was one of those guys. I was like, This is gonna catch on. This is people are not gonna spend their time online. What? What are you talking about? And I was like, oh, no, I think it will. Especially when I saw everybody pumping, especially you get government jobs. You, that's why I went to so when USA, that's one of the reasons I went on there because USA uh, jobs was available to look at what's opening. And I, I was interested in going with customs. So I applied for customs, right? They were looking for Spanish speakers, which I grew up in Miami. My parents are uh, Spanish Cuban. They came, grandparents from Spain went to Cuba. And then after the Castro revolution, they, they came to the United States and they lost everything. And they had my family to start over again. And I'm fortunate enough, to be in this great country and done quite quite well within one generation. The wealth they lost in Cuba, I, I've done quite well in this country. And uh, it's a very fortunate, great nation that we that we live in. And I talk about that in my books also. So I work on that and I put in there. And so they need people because in, in Miami, in Miami International Airport, most of the flights, 85% of them come from Latin America, right? So they want the customs officials to be able to engage and speak Spanish because it's easier to catch people who are mules or smuggling drugs you got to know what you're dealing with. And I, grew, and I grew up in Miami, so I grew up with all the different cultures from South America, from Latin America, from Mexico, a lot of my friends. So I knew all that, and I spoke Spanish. So I put in for the jobs, right? And I got it pretty quickly with customs. So that was something where I was going to law school, and I said, I said this is better because now I'm making quite a good money. I'm going to have a good pension, right? I'm in law enforcement, and I, and I really enjoy... It, it, it is satisfying what the kind of work I'll start doing. So you start there at the airport, you get your cut your, t your teeth into like password processing, 
And then I make one of their elite teams with customs called the Contraband Enforcement Team. And at the time, the 90s, in Miami, South Florida is making some of the biggest seizures in the country, right? You know, you still have the Cali cartel, you still have the Medellin cartel, and they're still pumping a lot of drugs. They're not going like what the Mexicans are do when they take over. They're doing it the uh, school way with cargo, they're doing it with ships, they're, they're doing it with through Florida and the Caribbean. And that's how they're getting it through to, especially in Florida. So it wasn't uncommon, you know, after you and the job, you know, so I was saying, or you're saying back then that's how they're doing it, or you're saying that's how they're doing it now. No, no, back then, back then. Okay, the, Cali, okay. the Medellin, Cali, all those guys have collapsed. And now the yeah. Mexicans, and, and I've written books about how strong they've got. And they, they're almost more powerful than, the, than the, the Columbus ever were. You know, you, you talk about El Chapo, El Menchos, and I'll, I'll go into that also, how strong they've become and how they changed the game completely and how we have to change. You know, and I've written about that too, my experiences. So I get in there. And so, you know, I'm now in the middle of the drug war. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the front line, you know, so, uh, with customs. Uh, so what do you do? I mean, what, what is that? What does that detail consist of? Yeah. So Miami has a ton of cargo that comes in through Latin America, right? And also passengers, a lot of it coming in. And, and my job in the border, you know, border authority is everything that comes international is subject to search, right? I don't need probable cause like I would later when I became an agent, which is a complete different game. So it was a lot easier to make seizures and, and, and make arrests because when you come in, you have your questions, people can be searched and you figure out what's going on right there. And with cargo side, it's everything comes in and especially from Latin America, transnational country, it wasn't uncommon for me to see, we're going to see 850 pounds of cocaine that was coming in in grouper of fish that was coming from Guayaquil, Colombian drugs, going to Colombia, going to Ecuador, and then being shipped because within five, six hours, it's in Miami. And the corruption was really bad in, in South Florida, right? At the airport, you had the ramp workers were dirty. You had the longshoremen were dirty. You, you had a, a ton of corruption. The money's overwhelming. And that stuff was never going to go where it's supposed to go. It gets ripped off, right? It, it has the, uh, the bill lading, right? Where it's supposed to go, but little stuff never go. When you got that kind of fish, when you look inside this ma major grouper, you get a kilo of coke next to a, a block of ice. <laughs> that stuff was going to get taken out. And, and, and that was not uncommon to see 600, 800 pounds coming in and get ripped off. And that's what we got. So wh what does that tell you? The stuff that got in? A lot. Yeah, what's, what's not getting caught? A lot. A lot. And they knew that was the quickest way to get it in because the demand back in the 80s and 90s and still today, unfortunately, is enormous for, for cocaine. I, I always said the way to stop the cartels, if people stop using the stuff, right? If people got the treatment, the cartels are the drug game, right? It's over. That's it. Yeah. We win the, the war on drugs. The way we win the war on drugs, and what you're to know, is from within. From within. But a lot of these bad countries are weaponizing cocaine, especially the Nicolas Maduros from Venezuela, right? You've got countries who are really enemies or communist enemies, and they're selling cocaine because they know that does damage to our country, their workforce, the people, their future, and everything else. It, Cuba, was it Castro said it was the, the, he said the pink menace, or he said that was the best way to undermine the United States was through the importation of drugs. Yeah, H H Hugo Chavez from Venezuela used to used to do that. Before. Oh, he died. Yeah, from Venezuela. Cuba saw it, but Castro did not want to be called a, a trafficker, right? Because he he saw what happened to Noriega, right? But back in the late eighties, Manuel Noriega, when he got involved, the U.S. ended up invading and bring him over. The, the former president of Honduras, Hernandez, he was a big time drug trafficker. He just got extradited to the United States. Maduro has been indicted. So I thought I, I had read something about Cuba, like Castro wasn't like involved in it, but he was allowing for a short, for a period of time, he like allowed planes to land or fly through, fly through yes. air airspace yes, and, then, he and then caught up with him. And then he was like, okay, we're done with that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't want to get caught up with that, but he would uh, tolerate some things, but not on the island side because he didn't want to give the United States a chance to bring him in because it happens to world leaders all over. They get involved in the drug game. It's a conspiracy against us in the United States. And we've had the case law and we extradite these guys and bring them over. And El Chapo is a perfect example of what happened to him when, when he finally got extradited. And now he is in the Supermax in uh, Florence, Colorado. And, and so he was a very, very powerful guy and not so much. So I, I'm in kind of that fascinating view, front line, right? I'm meeting a lot of people because we make a lot of seizures. So I'm networking with the FBI. I'm networking with ATF especially DEA, customs, at a time where Department of Treasury 
And after 9-11, everything changes, right? You know, every, everybody changes. ATF will end up going to justice. Customs will go to uh, Department of Homeland Security. It would leave Treasury. So a lot of things change. We're making a lot of good seizures. Ones that were kind of strange were like people who would swallow, like the pellets. Yeah. The swallowers. Oh, we would get a ton of that. I mean, it, it is really, I mean, we got a lot, but a lot also got through. And, and it's really sad because some of these people were peasants, right? They, they would get used or they say, if you don't do it, and these are the cartels, they go in these villages, right? And they pretty much forced these guys to do it or they're, they're going to hurt your family, kill the family. Some got paid. I mean, I found it, the guys who went, let's say, if you were from, you know, Miami or you were from Puerto Rico and you end up flying to, uh, you know, Cali or something like that, and you stay for three, four days. Like, why are you there? What, what was the purpose of your trip, right? right. And the purpose of the trip was to swallow these pellets. And I got really good at it. I mean, you could easily have two or three pounds of cocaine in you or heroin. Heroin really started picking up in the 90s with the Colombians, right? And that's, that's a lot of money, a lot of dope in there. But the problem with that <clears throat> is something if it leaks, you're going to get plain. It's so pure, you're not going to survive. So we get calls a lot of people are dead on arrival. They're on the planes. We got to clean them up. It's not easy to pass either. So if you can't pass this stuff fast enough, even when we catch them, we would have to take them to the hospital and MIA and give them these laxatives, and it still takes a while to pass it. These cartel members, if you're you make it and you're in one of these hotels, which happens all the time, you can't pass the stuff fast enough. They'll put a bullet in your head, they'll gut you, and they'll take the stuff out. So a lot of times they were lucky that we caught them because it, it, it was not not good stuff for them. And even then, sometimes they still need surgery. This stuff wouldn't come out. I mean, it's it's it's, it's really it's risky. It's sad. It's, it's horrible to see these people. And this is something I'm seeing firsthand. You know, a guy home with that, I say, man, this is the war on drugs. This is how it looks like. This, this is what's going on. It, it becomes normal and natural. You feel bad because people are being used, right? And well, much, it it's, much sexier, it's much sexier from, from Don Johnson's point of view. For the yeah. Don Johnson point of view, it's yeah. much sexier. He's got the Ferrari. He got the Ferrari, which is cool. He, got, he folds up. Remember, he would fold up the, the suit. Do you remember the, yeah. the jacket? The, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he, so. he had the cool the cool colors, right? Yeah. yeah. So far, your version of it sucks. Your version is work, right? Oh. That yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of work. That's that's true. It's, it's not glamorous, but it, you you're satisfied. Or at least you're stopping that from going to somebody else that's gonna maybe hurt their life. That that part there. So you see a lot of that. Miami, I, it's just a ton of that. They'll put it in the stems of flowers. I mean, talk, talk about the detail of work, right? They will hollow them out and fill them all up. That's impossible. I mean, it's really hard unless we had intelligence or a great dog to really hit that because the x-rays are hard to reach. So they would do crazy ways you could imagine to smuggle stuff in. They would hollow out tiles, you know, for roofing and put a kilo in each one. I, I wrote a I wrote a story about a guy. That's what they did. They had the concrete yeah. pallets and concrete tiles that they were yes. pulled them in and, and came in with pallets. Yes. It, 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 that's, a, that's a level of corruption because that's not really going to where it's supposed to go. That's going to get ripped off and it's going to other places. So that's how corrupt it was in the 80s and 90s and, and beyond. And things have changed now. And I'll talk a little bit about that. What happens to the collapse? You know, Escobar was killed, the collapse of the Midian Cali cartels, and then the Mexican cartels stepping up and working with the FARC, which has now changed. Even they changed now. And, and now they have a different name and, and they're working with them. They're bringing the coke to them and Mexico takes care of all distribution. They handle from there on. They, they take it all. They don't have to worry about that. You just make it, we take care of it. We go into Colombia. So the Mexicans pretty much are running Colombia and, and Central America. It, it, they're not just in Mexico. They're all over the region. And, and, and then, of course, on top of that, you have the collapse with the communism and socialism that's taken over the region, which really paralyzes the whole country. That's why we we're, we're really have to keep an eye on what's going on in there. So I made a lot of contacts and I said, you know what? This is cool. I don't mind doing this kind of work, but I wouldn't mind since I dealt with a lot of agents, investigators, to take it to a next level, which is what you do as an agent. I mean, you're not stuck. To, I'm not stuck to the airport now. As an agent, I get to go all over the country, all over the world, right? Make my cases, but there's a probable cause and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I network a lot with FBI, ATF, DEA, and Customs. You know, it makes sense since I was ready with Customs, I would just go over as an agent, right? Since I worked a lot with these guys. But they didn't want to give up a lot of their inspectors because they know it's hard to fill those positions. So they didn't want to hire. So I had to go with other agencies and put in for them because I, I, it's not fair to me. I wanted to be an agent. I wanted to be an investigator. I wanted to do other things. 
So eventually ATF was the fastest one to pick me up. You know, within that time, within the Department of Treasury, I get picked up with them. And then a year later, at 2000, I get picked up as an ATF agent and more in Tampa, Florida. Nice. Which so I, I, for, for clarity purposes, so here's what, you know, because just this is what I, I, I understand. So, and I only understand this because I've written several stories. I wrote a story called American Narco. And, and so it, it so you're saying like, right, as a custom agent, like you find this, you find the drugs and you're like, okay, then you're notifying somebody else because, and then they're setting that, trying to either follow that, that, you know, the, that, that, dr that drug shipment and bust the guys. Is that it? Because it, so I, let me give, yeah. can I give you an example? I had a, what the story I wrote, they had shipped in marijuana in these tiles mm. and they allowed the shipment. Like they picked, they delivered the shipment. Put, and these guys loaded it into their warehouse, sat it there for like a week, yep. and there was a tracking device sure. inside the thing. And so they start unpacking the whole thing, and suddenly there's this black box with a little light on it and these wires, and they're like, oh, shit. They throw it. They run. you know. But, of course, by that point, they're pulling up, and they the, the, the gig is up. Yeah, they bust them like two days later. They come and raid their house or something, their, their houses and stuff. But so at this point with customs, you're just saying, hey, here's what we found. And they're doing the rest of that. You wanted to actually be the guy to okay. go the next level. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just I, to find what the next level is. Yeah, because they're, they're customs ins ins inspectors, right? That's the term. I, I think it's changed now, but the term used to be customs ins inspectors, but you had arrest authority and you did everything else. And then there's the agents, the criminal investigators that go and these, you give them, hey, I just had this huge seizure right now with this fish, right? 850 pounds. All right, we can sometimes have set up surveillance within the airport, right? Close to the airport, the warehouse. But if it's going, let's say, to New York City, right? Well, they're taking it from there. Yeah. They're there. We're not going to New York City. I'll, I'll, I I got to stay and do my job and do the next shift and, and get some more dope that's coming in because you know what? It doesn't stop. They, 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 they knew if they, they, they factor those losses in because that's, that's part of doing business. Right. With the Colombian cartels. It just they just keep on bringing it in. Okay, hey, they got this one. Guess what? We just got another four thousand in, and and that doesn't that it's it's good. So I wish to I picked up with ATM, but sometimes you don't know, right? You take a chance. Sometimes they may say the Southwest border. Sometimes you you might have to go to New York City or a big city where it's really expensive. I got fortunate enough. I stayed in uh, Florida. I went to school like I said, St. Louis University. Up just north of Tampa, in where you are, Pasco County, and uh, I started working from there. And I was fortunate that the group I started, a lot of guys worked undercover because you can't just go into undercover work cold like that, right? If you do that, you're going to get hurt. Right. I mean, you can watch all the Miami Miami Vice you want, and watch all the TV shows and and Donnie Brasco, and, and that was also very popular back in the uh, in the nineties. Remember Donnie Brasco with uh, Al Pacino yeah. and Johnny Depp? Yeah, you know, you watch all yeah. that stuff, but it's one thing on television, right? Like you said, and one thing, the real world. And the real world is you've got to know how these guys, because like I said, I grew up in Catholic schools, right? And now I have to learn this world. I learned a little bit for the drug world, which is fascinating. But now I got to work face to face undercover where I pretend to be like these guys and how to fool some of these guys who are hardened professional criminals. That's all they do and make them think I'm one of them because I'm nothing like it. I, I, I was going to say, which is, is you know, you like you said, you watch it on TV and people think, oh, I could do that. No, you can't. They, they spot you in a second. It, I used to joke around, you know, with the guys in, in prison, like, you know, they, we just be walking and uh, they see me and they say, Hey Cox, what's up? And I go, I can't call it. And they just stop. They go, they just start laughing. They go, stop. I go, what are you talking? I, I did that. I did that good. They go, no, it, it's even worse when you do it. <laughs> they're like, they're like, you're not even close. You can't uh. even come close to pulling out and you can't, you just can't fake that. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's hard. It, it's a real. You really have to become an actor to be able to fake. That's true. That's to true. be able to fake that, you have to be good at it. It it takes time. It takes time. You got to practice it, and it, it takes years. <clears throat> so I had good mentors, right? I watch a lot, and and you develop your own technique, right? You watch these guys. I spoke Spanish, so that was an advantage. <clears throat> I make sure my English was broken. I didn't sound like that. I, I just came from Cuba this año, right? Right. So. You, 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 you have to come up and let my hair really long. I think I sent you some pictures. I don't know if you saw them yet. I haven't seen them, seen them yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll see them. I'll check them out. All right. I sent you some pictures. My hair was long. I had a big beard. 
I didn't want to get all the tats. Some guys have, because when I got out of it, I knew I'll be done with it. Right. right? I want to go back to who I was. I, 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 because I don't want to be saying, oh, great, I got this now. People say, what the heck's wrong with this? So that was never me. I, I never really cared for it. That, that wasn't my thing. So I wanted to fake enough. The beard's okay. The hair was long enough. You do the accents. You get to know the culture, get to know these guys. It was easier to deal with people that they were not Spanish speakers. You tell your story, who you're working with. You say, hey, these families are looking, the cartels are looking for guns, right? Because they are. And my job here is to be say, ATF is to buy a lot of guns. And these guys, I don't want to fill any paperwork, right? Because I don't want to show up in no shop and put my information right. in there, right? So th these guys will sell me guns off the street, untraceables. And you pay a premium for that because that's what you want. And a lot of these guys have horrific criminal histories. So I dealt a lot with repeat violent offenders. I dealt a lot with gang members, uh, armed drug traffickers, international firearms traffickers, domestic firearms traffickers. I dealt with armed home invaders, cases for murder for hires. So that was ATF's niche. What, what does ATF do? Alcohol, tobacco, firearms. Well, it's a small A for alcohol, a small T for tobacco, a huge F and an immediate E for explosives. So we do a lot of gun cases. Neil say a lot of guns, and, that, and that's what ATF is. And so I found that fascinating. And I, I knew something about guns, but man, I, I became an expert on pretty much the Gun Control Act, NFA, National Firearms Act, and all the different weapons from machine guns, silencers, pipe bombs. You know, ATF sometimes called with all the training. ATF stands for all the fun because we would do a lot of shooting. I mean, we, we, I, I trained in handguns from pistols to revolvers, my M4, which is a short, short barrel rifle, right? I had shotguns, yeah, something short barrel shotguns also we were shooting. So we trained a lot of different weapons. And then we also were familiarized in case we come across different machine guns, we'll, we know what we're doing, right? Got to make sure and check all that stuff out. So <clears throat> that's, what, that's what we did, ATF. And, and something that's early enough, you have to cut your teeth. You know, what, one of the guys I worked with, he was Puerto Rican, and he was involved back in the 80s in a shootout where he had a SIG 9 millimeter. The bad guy had SIG 9 millimeter. He fired the round. And his round went into his gun and plugged the barrel. So he's like oh. this, and the round goes like this. It's like one in a million. Damn, and Hialeah back in the 80s. So it, it can get ugly and wild. So we had a good time. We had some good stories, and I learned a lot from him and him being Puerto Rican. And I saw how he tackled things and all that. So I developed my own style. We worked a lot together, and then I grew up. And then you know what also helps? Having good informants. You, yeah. you have a good informants, which I developed a lot of these guys. They can pretty much, you, you walk on water, you, you say gold. You say, hey, he vouches for you. There's some more questions. It's yeah. just, do, let's do business. Hey, he said, you're the guy. Okay, man, this is what you want. No questions asked. And boom, 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 boom. This is what these guys do. But if you have a bad informant who's playing both sides, it'll destroy your investigation. Yeah, yeah you have to have them accountable. So you really, and once you, that's why I like to, once I had the introduction, I cut them out. Yeah. Done. And I, yeah. I want to deal with the drama with an informant. They can ruin your case. I put too much hard work because ATF is a very smaller outfit than the FBI or DEA, right? We have less than 3,000 agents, I think 2,800, right? FBI has four times that, enormous size. So we, we just can't delegate, hey, I need you to do surveillance. I need you to do undercover. I'm the case. I do everything. I, I, I'm the, the undercover. I'm the case agent right? I deal with property. I deal with my own intelligence workup. I, I wear all the different hats because you have to, because we're a smaller outfit. If you want to do the bigger cases. Now, if you want to small, you don't do that. Right. I was going to say the uh, informant thing, I'm, I'm researching a story right now and it's like, it's funny, you know, you do all the incident reports, you, you read through the incident reports and the first thing they do, like literally, obviously this guy got busted. You know, he got, he got busted. I think he got, no, he got busted for, I think it was for a gun actually. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and he makes them, they, they have him make a, a, a couple of meth buys, you know, and just, he's just wired. Like he's just wired. They're just control buys. Then they have him eventually introduce, you know, his, his boss, right. which is the undercover. Then the undercover goes with him on a couple of buys. Sure. Then just the undercover buys, and then they they cut the informant out. And yeah. you know, and to me, like having been in prison, I realized that the problem is like if your whole you can't let him keep buying, you can't let the cut the the informant yeah. keep buying because first of all, he's unreliable. He's got a record. 
And then what happens if he gets busted for something else? You know, you, you can't put him on the stand like, oh, since then you've been busted for this and this. Like, and he has a huge incentive to lie and the agent doesn't. So, you know, you want to put somebody on the stand and you want it to be the agent. That's right. A clean jacket. Job. He introduced me. Here's what I did. I bought a kilo over the course of the next month. Yeah. Or two months. That's that's the best way to do it. You you have to because and, and unfortunately some of these guys have, have drug addictions, right? Yeah. They and they and they keep on doing stuff, they get messed up and they don't they're not right when they're high, right? And and they do stupid things. So those are the factors you gotta get into. That's why I was fortunate. Some people don't want to do undercover work. Not for everybody. I, I just I, I liked it. I, I really decided I, I kinda like playing the role. I like and I dealt with all kinds of people. I just told you about the, the variety, but I also the variety of people from different Hispanic groups, different blacks, different other European groups, right? Just a variety, a variety of people. And because it worked and what I was doing and makes sense. It's based on what's really going on. The cartels have people. They need guns, right? And by the way, not only buying the guns, but I also like, like selling some drugs on the side. What else do you have for personal or for other use? So I buy dope and guns. Sometimes you come across some other stuff. Hey, I have also some body armor. You're looking for the body? Yeah, I'll take some ballistic armor. It's amazing what people start telling you and what they do and what else it leads to. Hey, I'm also doing this too. Hey, this guy is also into uh, explosives or into this. Oh, hey, this guy's selling lost cigarettes without tax stamps. You know, we do those cases too, a lot less. But yeah, we do all that stuff. So it really opens up when people talk and they feel confident with you, you get a lot of your friends. And I had everything, like I said, for, for trial purposes, I want to make it like a movie, right? I want the jury to feel comfortable. I want the, first of all, I had to make the prosecutor feel comfortable. And once he feels comfortable, then the jury. Did you hear that? Yes. Can you hold on a second? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Let's uh, just freak. I don't even know what that is, but here's the funny thing about it. This <laughs> is since I'm speaking with you, is my wife's ex-boyfriend mm. was arrested for he had a dispute with a guy over I'm I'm pretty sure I think it was drugs or something, and he made a bomb. Oh no. And left it for the guy. It didn't go off. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. But he ended up going to jail for it. And like, he's on like the no fly list. And so every time I get a package and I walk out, my first thought when I see the package is, yeah, I would too. Please let this guy, <laughs> please let this really be from Amazon. And I keep, you know, it's so funny. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I get deliveries. It's, you're not, it's like, it's just, it's just there. And I always, I'll, I don't unwrap it. My girlfriend comes in. I'm like, you're unlock it. You're, you're opening that. It's it's not uncomfortable. A lot of people get into making these pipe bombs, right? And they tighten them up in there. But it's also very dangerous. If you don't know how you do it right, they can some lift the flit too early and explode. So they have damage. It's it's very volatile. I, very I actually clean. had a I actually had a friend that was making a pipe bomb when he was like 15, 16 years old, and it exploded, blew his hands off, the shrapnel hit, like he bled out within a minute. Oh no! But 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 he he died and. You know, just a kid, just being stupid, you know, yeah. thought it was cool, had made a couple small ones and just playing, never once thinking to himself like, hey, this could be it. This like, could be you it. Un you understand what you're playing with, right? Like this isn't a joke. No, this is, it isn't like playing with like firecrackers and stuff like that. It's even, you, you might lose your finger or something. You're not careful with it, but a pipe bomb, that, that's no joke. And, and then these guys get really nasty with it. Some of them put like shrapnel inside to really do some serious, serious damage. So yeah, so that's the kind of case I wanted to do. I, I wanted to make sure for the jury and for the prosecutor that we had good video, right? I wanted to make sure it is clear. It's like watching a movie. I wanted the jury to see, okay, this is the evidence. Watch the movie. And that's a big difference you see between the federal side and state and local, right? Especially with the local sometimes, it, it gets a, a little bit different. Federal, we, ha we have a little more time to take our time with the case make it the strongest case we can and get as many people as possible. That, that's why we uh, have a little more time. And it's different. That's why I like the federal system. We have a chance to really make the cases bigger and stronger. And we have good prosecutors. That's A lot of them are career prosecutors, and they really know how to make good cases. So that's what I did. I wanted to make sure undercover-wise I had, and sometimes with informants, there's always issues with the with the equipment sometimes. They, they could be messed up and everything else. So they're not professionals, right? They, they didn't go to school for this. 
They don't understand case law. They don't understand entrapment, right? You, you want to make sure people understand, you know, this is what they do. This is what they're involved in. You don't want to bring someone who's not involved in this kind of work. They're actively doing this. They're predisposed. This is what they do. And, right. this, and, and they have the history of doing this. Right. So these are all the factors you got to come. As a professional, you bring that to the table. And informants are, I hate to say it, necessary evil, right? Because they are the eyes and ears in the street. Because I can't live in the street, right? The reality is I pretend to. Right. And then I go back to the office. I could do a lot of paperwork. I got to go to the prosecutor. I got to deal with evidence. I, I, it's, it's, I got to talk and give a briefing. So it's it's a whole different world. And, and you just show up. But the good thing about them, even though I would cut them out, remember their eyes and ears, they can still tell you, hey, I heard so-and-so has some doubts about you. Mm-hmm. I need, I need to tighten this up a little bit. When you come back with me and let's have another conversation with them, make sure you, you vouch for me and make sure, hey, this is the guy, man. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. So those are good things. You keep them a distance, but you still have to make sure that they're listening to what's going on because that's important because the last thing you want to do is, is get uh, cut off guard. And, and I was fortunate enough, I mean, there's always some hairy close moments, right? But you know, you, you got to have, and, I, and I'll give you an example, and I, and I put it in, in my book, ATF Undercover, which I talk about. And this happens, and I did a lot of work in Pasco County, and I had an undercover apartment in Westy Chapel. I had, I did, I live. I know, I know. I did, I used to live there in West Chapel, and then moved down south when I first you know, started working out there. A lot cheaper than Tampa when I, in 2000. I know what, it, it, 54 is completely different than it was 20 some years ago. Four. Well, I live off, I live off 56, you know, 54 turns oh, into 56, so. But yeah, it's even further. Like it's a 15 minute drive to 75 from where I live. It's like living in the Truman Show, though. I mean, it's the houses are everything's brand new. Every, everything's underground. You know, all the houses look. I mean, it's it's a great it's it's a great area. Like everybody, it's funny on on my street. There's two sheriff's deputies. There's like an insurance salesman. There's a couple bankers. Like the only I'm the riffraff on the street. So, you're, you're not you know, 56. You're not too far from from Lando Lakes either. Then, no, no, very very close, very close. Yeah, yeah Michael. I, I, I guess the Lando. Lakes. Yeah, I I got to, I got to know Pasco really well from making the cases. So I got to know Pasco. I don't know how much you know Pasco County, but I I got to know all the way to New Port Ritchie, Port Ritchie, the Hudson area, even across to near Tarpon Springs, and going to Zephyr Hills. So this takes place, I'll tell you this story here, this happens in Zephyr Hills. Zephyr Hills, people who don't know Zephyr Hills or Date City, at the time I was working, I would say it was back in 2000 to uh, to 2012. And this story takes place about 2009, 2010. So that's, that's, this is the D- Date City Pasco I'm talking about. And the Mexicans were picking it up, right? They're moving a lot of meth. There's no more meth labs. There, there's still some, but now they're bringing a lot of the meth from Mexico. They're just right. piping it in. And that whole area became a big pipeline. Right. Which, which I, I was saying is, I, I think a lot of still drugs and a lot of Mexicans still out there. Which this is how, where everything's changed a lot. And this is a trailer. I mean, with this guy, he has a, he he's he's a career criminal, drug trafficker. Where right? I had an informant make an introduction. First time me and him are sitting in the car together. I meet him out three hundred one, and we're going to drive to these trailers, shady trailers, predominantly Hispanic, right? And he, he's talking to me. He sent me his history. He said, man. Yeah, I'll get you these guns and all that, but I, I used to move a lot of Coke, a lot of product. I, I, I was moving two or three easy kilos a week. Uh, I was like, okay. So I said, you tell me. I, I mean, he just got out. He wants to get back into the game. This is what he does. I said, okay. So he, he took me there. He's a non-Spanish speaker. And he, he takes me to the trailers. And he said, hey, this is my guy here. He has the guns. Some guys give a heads up a little nervous about this. They say sometimes guys who buy guns a lot are feds. I said, no, man. I'm no fed. Of course, you got to deny that. You're not gonna. <laughs> you got me. You got me in there. It's over. <laughs> Let me take you back home. No, that's that's gonna happen. So you deny that, and he goes in there, <clears throat> and I talk to his guy who's there. He's Hispanic, bald head, right? And we're talking a little bit in Spanish. He's testing me out, which is fine. And he goes, he goes in a trailer. So him and I are sitting outside in my truck, and I see more people. We get out of the car, and he's on one side. I'm on the other side, and I can see. There are a lot more people going to the other side of the trailer. Right. A lot more people going inside. He can't see that. I can see that. Right. So I can see that. So you're going to have instincts to say, listen, I just met you guys. The deal we're supposed to be doing is for an AK-47 with 75-round drum, two Glock pistols, 
almost an ounce, ounce of meth for a little over $3,000, right? And I don't feel comfortable. He goes, hey, listen, the stuff's inside, but these guys don't want to bring it out. So I drove out here. Normally what you do is you wrap it up, you bring in the car real quick and we're done. I get the hell out of here, right? And he said, but he wants to come in. You go inside. I was like, and I know there's more people coming in. And he doesn't know that I know that already. So I'm, I'm, I'm just like, no, dude, I don't want to be anybody. I said, no, it's fine. I said, no. And I said, okay, what do you give me the money? And I'll go get, I'll get it for you. I said, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I said, what's going to happen is you're going to walk away with 3000 and I'm going to have a bigger headache to deal with to chase you and everybody else who just stole my money, which that was going to be a rip. So right. I said, I'll give you five minutes. I'm going to sit in the car. Either you bring it or I'm out of here. Because I, either I, and that's, that's the beauty of being the case agent and the uh, undercover is that I don't feel the pressure. Let's say I was just the undercover and I'm working for somebody else, working their case, right? Something you feel the pressure, you want to make it happen. For me, I'm both. And if it happens, great. If not, I got a lot of work. I got other people I'm dealing with. I, I got you today. I got someone else tomorrow, right? So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever felt that kind of pressure where I had to make it happen because I, don't, I want to go home at the end. That's, that's the most important thing. No, no deals. Five minutes later, a Honda Odyssey pulls up Guy pops up with an AK-47, same for a round drum. So him and I talk, he sells me the gun, I take a look at it, I give him the money for that, and then he has a backpack, another friend had bought him, and, he's, and he sells me the Glocks with the, uh, the crystal meth. I said, hey dude, next time, just keep it between us, and I don't want to deal with this circus next time. And he understood right. And he understood yeah. that. So what, what? I think it was testament. Right, so, so why would you go, why, if, if the AK wasn't in there, mm -hmm. they showed up later. Like, why am I going in the trailer? Like, why? What do you think they were trying to get you in the trailer for? Uh, I think they want to rip me off. Oh, okay. I think they want to take my money. So, okay. Yeah. I think they want to rip me off. That's what I think they want to take my three thousand dollars, three thousand four dollars, and, and hit me. He said, "Hey, man, this, hey, this could be easy hit right here, and and, and we don't have to sell anything because you you don't know so these, some of these gang. I mean, these are gang members, by the way. These aren't average. So these these this is a trailer, shitty trailer in Zephyr Hills." There's a lot of gangs in that area. I want you to understand a lot of Hispanic gangs, a lot of gang members, sell a lot of meth, a lot of heroin, armed with teeth. I don't um, think of that for hills and that's what I think of. like that at all. I mean, it's it's, it's very, you know, rural. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It seems like it's... Read read my book and, and I'll give example after example of that area. Go, on, go in there and stuff like that. It's, it, it is hot. And that's when I was there. I think it's gotten worse, what I see, because mm -hmm. the cartels have just gotten stronger. When I was there, they were coming up. You know, Chapa was good. Sinaloa is strong. But but now you have the rise of CJNG, which yeah. is Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Yeah. Major rival for Sinaloa, right? El Mencho, he, he's now the big player. Cervantes, right? <clears throat> and they're, they're going to war. You know, and all these guys, you know, El Chapo, El Mencho, give your, your audience a little background. All these guys came out of absolute poverty. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they were selling avocados and oranges in the street. And now I've risen to me big drug lords where their assets are over $50 billion. And that's according to the Mexican government and the U.S. government. So you tell me they're not making drug lords in Mexico when these guys, got, and, and most of these guys are illiterate. They dropped out of school when they're in the fourth or fifth grade, right? But what are they good at? They're good at killing. Yeah. And they're not afraid to kill. Yeah, they're brutal. They're brutal. Say so brutal. Uh, brutal. Is it El Mayo, which was Chapo's... We basically started the Sinaloa, right? With and then El Chapo kind of came in right after. But I was gonna say El Mayo, like I, I heard that he still drives like an old. Pi he's he's worth you know billions and billions, or, you know whatever, and he still drives an old pickup truck. That's smart around town, like you know, like he's not, you know, he lives in a, a you know different places, and you know same thing with El Chapo. He's always all he's really he's really good at survive. He was up until. The United States got him, you know, yeah. but he was really good at at surviving, you know, through brutality and just forth thinking, like always right. have an escape route, always be thinking, don't all, keep staying in the same place, change, change locations, you know. That's what El, El Chapo was nicknamed also El Rapido, the quick one. He was the master of the tunnels. Right. right? I, I remember that great tunnel he had the second time he was captured underneath oh, that, that prison? Unbelievable. Now, you know what's funny about that? I had read that like the area that was where the prison is, mm -hmm. it was actually the new generation that was in charge of digging, even though they're rivals, of digging the tunnel. Yeah, but at that time, I think at that time, they were still 
2015, yeah, they began to go a little bit sideways. Not as bad as now, but it, it would get a lot worse. But what a corruption. What that, that's one of the things I talk about. Is that we don't have a uh, equal partner in the war on drugs. The corruption in Mexico is so unbelievable. And that's the reason I bring that up because during the trial for El Chapo in, in, in New York, it was brought, these government witnesses testified that El Chapo offered, this is before Lopez Obrador, the president before that with uh, Peña Nieta, he offered him of a bribe. Nieta won allegedly, according to court documents, he wanted a $250 million payout. So we want to look for El Chapo. They said, you don't worry about it. You can be a fugitive for another 15 years, right? He said, no, I'll pay you $100 million. And allegedly, witnesses said testified, he took it. He took it. So if the top of Mexican government is on, on the take, then we have no chance. And this is what right. the battles we're, we're fighting. You know, you, you see case after case after general, attorney general. I mean, just get keep on getting arrested for being involved in, in money laundering and, and, and involved in all this stuff here. And, and this guy, El Mencho, out of CJNG, he was former law enforcement. He was out of Jalisco, right? He, he was involved. So a lot of these guys know the game. They know it. And he's the same way we just talked about at Mayo when I was reading Guadalajara because now it's the battle for Guadalajara, which is where a lot of stuff is going on. But he looks like he's won because they were trying to split. You know how everything is. Everybody wants to be king, right? Yeah. One day you're the king, they, they want to take you out, right? El Mencho had guys he brought in that was former Millennium Cartel guys that split, right? And they want to take over. And this guy's name is Skipper right now. But if, if you look at the videos, he has him tortured, right? Wrapped up, kill him, and then left the park bench. It's, this is what happens when people betray El Mencho, right? And stuff like that. So right now, it seems like he still has the lockdown in Guadalajara, which is very important for him. And he's the same guy that you're talking about, Amayo. He likes to live modestly. Not like Escobar, right? That lived in that big palace, right? Everybody knew... Where, where he lived and where he was at, but he brought he bribed everybody. These guys have to low key. El Chapo's bounty was five million, right? At his peak when he escaped the second time. After Sean Penn and Kate Del Castillo interviewed him yeah. and said, Well, if you haven't seen that interview uh, and video, man, you guys need to check that out. Rolling Stone magazine. That's unbelievable. Great. Unbelievable stuff. He's I, I can't believe Sean Penn did that because you don't know. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that you know, listen, they don't care. He El Trampo didn't even know who he was. Yeah. Like he's probably thinking, well, my celebrity will probably help help me a little bit as or keep me safe a little bit. No, it won't. He didn't even know who you are. No. No, I I would not have done that. That could have got really ugly. And they almost caught him after the interview because they were tracking the Mexican actress Castillo's phone. US authorities were were tracking and, and just missed him barely. Just barely. It will take a few more years to finally catch him again. And they will not escape the third time. Not escape a third time. Well, the MN, like, it, they obviously realized, like, look, we're just not going to be able to keep this guy here. We we have to send him to the United States. And that's so sad because you know what? Now we have the costs, right? Now the U.S. tax dollar has to pay for keeping this guy for life, feeding him the expenses, the legal, ev everything we pay because the Mexican government is so corrupt, they couldn't do it themselves. And it's case after case like this. Very sad. Very I sad think, situation. You know, it, it's funny. Like, I, I, first of all, people are always, you know, oh, the, you know, like the U.S. government's corrupt. Like, they, look, there, there's some corruption here and there, yeah, but true. you have no idea what it's That's like true. in other countries. That's true. In other countries, it's, look, if, and not just that, it's like, look, you're paying, you're a police officer in Mexico making six or seven hundred dollars a month. You're nothing. That's nothing. Like, like, I get it. You shouldn't, you know, you, sh you shouldn't be involved in corruption. You should be, but, it's hard not to be, not only for the money, but it's dangerous. Like if you end up being a cop, like it's, it's kind of like the, 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 what was it? Uh, shoot. I, I was going to say what there was a movie about it. El Cholo was his name. El Cholo was a guy who, his rival, they, they got wrapped up and executed. Look up his name, El Cholo. Oh, oh. Look at the video. He, he, he's getting, you see the guy from uh, CJ and G behind him in masks. And next thing you know, he ends up in a park bench. You see the pictures wrapped up. He was tortured. I said, this is what happened to El Cholo, the traitor. You don't play. You don't play. It's just a, it's a horrible situation in general. Yeah. So, you know, when you were talking about like the higher up, upper echelon of the government, I have a buddy named Juan Sanchez who was in, in Venezuela, right? He was a Venezuelan citizen, came to the United States, started doing real estate, doing very well, 
2008 financial crisis hits, his his subdivisions and the developments start going under. He needs money. So he goes to Venezuela and he starts pitching to Venezuelans like, hey, you should invest. And so he, people in the government invest. Basically, the equivalent of the U.S., the the head, U, like the U.S. attorney here, right? The U.S. attorney general mm -hmm. in Venezuela ends up investing with him. Mm -hmm. Multiple people in the in the government investing. But they're in gov they're, he finds out later when Juan gets caught. The money they're investing is money they're laundering for Mexico. For the cartels. For the cartels through Venezuela. They give it to Juan. Juan loses the money. Oh, no. And now they're threatening to kill him. He actually goes back to Venezuela. They kidnap him for four or five days. He eventually escapes, gets on a plane, flies back to the United States. But when he gets caught, he eventually obviously cooperates. He cooperates and the... FBI comes in and the the CIA comes in. He he they said they never said CIA, but they never showed badges, anything. My lawyer told me I think they were CIA. They come in and they say, Listen, we looked at your phone. We see phone numbers and names in here of people that we've had indicted from Venezuela that are in the government. And they so they start asking him, You know this guy, you know this guy? He goes, Yeah, I know that guy. And they said, we've had him indicted on a sealed indictment. We can't get him. But, you know, so they asked him what happened. He tells them. And he says, do you want me to get him to, to come to the United States? And they go, yeah, but he's, he would never do that. And he's, he's not that stupid. And they go, and, and Juan goes, no, no, he's that stupid. He goes, you don't get to become, you don't get that high in the government without being, you don't get it through brains. You get it through brutality. That's yeah, true. So he co he contacts him because the guy had asked him to try and get him a travel permit in the United States so he could bring his family into the United States to visit Disney World. Mm -hmm. So he contacts him, sends him an email. No, no, that's not it. But his 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 visa had been denied by the State Department. He said, "All you have to do." is have the U.S. Embassy write him a letter saying that it was a mistake and it's been approved uh -huh. and he can come. They wrote him a letter. He said, literally, we're talking about three days later, he's on a plane, flies into Miami, and they arrest him in the airport in Miami with his family thinking they're going to Disney World. Disney World. No, no, no. And, and no, he's going to the slammer now. <laughs> you know what happened is he 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 rolled over on a bunch of people. He ended up getting like four years or something and got back out. Oh, did he? Massive, massive indictment. This guys do it's like at that level. You you got to cooperate. You got to flip. You got to turn. If, if, and if, if and one thing I've noticed, all these guys too, because if you don't, you get, you get the hammer. You get slammed. Yeah. You get the mo the most time. So yeah, you know they're just are. Yeah, you know, some of Venezuela, man. Venezuela, it with Nicolas Maduro now, it, it's a narco state. It, it has become a he he he's not a communist anymore. And remember him, Hugo Chavez. They, this guy's no communist. This, this guy, it, it's all about making money. And but the people suffer. He keeps them suffering. This guy's a dictator. He, he, he's a yeah. narco dictator. He's been indicted by our government, and, and to bring more. But you know what upsets me is a little politics here. But we'll talk a little a little bit of everything. My books are all about this. But Joe Biden threw him a lifeline, administration, to see if Chevron go back there and get oil pumped up because we don't want to deal with the Russians, right? We're, we're tired of the Saudis, we, the stuff he's done, uh, you know, Mohammed bin Salman. So it's like we, we want to work with the Venezuelans, who's all the stuff this guy's done. He said that's atrocities to his people. If, if you're not about him, you're, you're, you're done. And that's why Miami, you know, has been transformed with the Venezuelans coming over. Like the Cubans did, you know, from the 60s on. The Venezuelans right. have brought a lot of money. Doral, the only familiar with South Florida, has changed immensely with the Venezuelans. A lot, a lot of the money has come over, transformed it. So that's that's what you're seeing. And people say, well, man, America has it. No, yeah, the United States has issues. I live in Virginia now, and I was fortunate enough to, I, I like to travel like history. My background, you know, I told you political science and history. I went to Mount, Mount Vernon, and I've gone to Monticello. Well, Mount Vernon is Washington's home, and then yeah. at Monticello, Jefferson's home. And and I visited there, and uh, even it's true, 1797, you know, Washington had just finished his second term, will not run for a third term, does not want to be seen like King George or, or a dictator. He says, even then, applies today, we had issues, 
you know, there's it, no perfect democracy. It's not a perfect system, but it's the best that's out there. And I think it applies today the same thing. It's not perfect, people. We're not have a perfect system, but it's the best. It's the best that's out there. Trust me, I've seen. I, I studied politics internationally. The corruption. Yeah, we're going to have corrupt officials. We're going to have problems, but it's the best that's out there. So th that's where we're at with with the corruption in, in, in Mexico. But the Mexico government, it, it's probably worse. I, I think it's is stronger than than the Colombians were, because their their reach is all over Central America. It's all over South America, and they have a lot of people in the United States. And, and and they're reaching not just in customs officials, just not not just with politicians, but you see it deeper and deeper in our country because the money is so big and so out there, and the corruption is big. It's corrupt here, but they're corrupting here. So what are our solutions? We, we need to deal with the problem with that treatment. We need people to get off it. We need people to work on their on, on their addictions because it's just going to get worse. And, and they want to like like Maduro said, like I said, they're weaponizing cocaine to help destroy this country. They, they think it, it's, it's going to fall like a rotten apple from within. People are going to fall and break. And that's what they're trying to do. So it's funny. So I, I, I wish, why can't I remember the name of this, this book? I used to know it too. And look, trust me, somebody in the comment section will, will tell me the name of the book. It was actually came out probably 50, probably 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And it's about, there's a, a like a, an evangelist, right? Like, like a, like a preacher, super rich preacher, mm. his son gets caught. He has a security detail, right? Like he's got the, several of these mega churches. He has a security detail. And one of the, the lead security agent or security person in charge of his security detail is a former DEA agent that had to retire because of brutality. Like he'd been caught multiple times. Like, and you know, he was he'd been written up. He finally retires. Mm. Well, the, I'll call him the preacher. The preacher's son ends up getting caught like smoking, I don't know, smoking, dr doing drugs or something. One of his friend ODs on Coke or something. I forget what it was. But he he's upset and he ends up venting to this former DEA agent. So his security, you know, head of security. So his head of security, he's like, you know, he says, how much money do I give? You know, every month, every, every year. And he's like, oh, like a million dollars to these programs. And he goes, he says, is it even helping? He's like, no, it's not going to, uh, this is going to do nothing. And he says, well, what can end this? And he said, well, you know, it's so out of control that the government can't, they just can't, it's everything they can do to try and keep it stemmed. If you could get it pulled back a little bit, then they could probably get a better handle on it. And he said, there's an idea we used to kick around at the DEA. And he said, well, what was that? He said, if you poisoned the drug supply, then the 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 hardcore he said the casual users aren't the problem he says casual users would just stop he said but the drug addicts he said they would have to seek some kind of rehabs any rehab yeah right and so they end up he ends up going to somewhere and who knows where brazil i forget where it was <laughs> but someplace and he, he ends up he ends up finding this chemist and he ends up getting these mushrooms that allows them to poison the drug supply right like coke and he, he, of course, he, he gets a bunch of retired DEA agents, you know, friends of his to help him. There's a group of like six of them. And he ends up poisoning a whole bunch of drugs. And what happens is the hardcore users, they, they inhale it. And then if they do enough of it, it ends up breaking down and shutting down their, their livers and they die. So they end up doing this on a massive scale. Oh my gosh. And I, I listen, it was and of course, what happens is it, it it works. But the problem is, is what he tells the preacher is like, you know, there will be some people will get sick. There may be a few deaths. And he knows the reality is there's going to be thousands. And there ends up being tens of thousands of deaths because they do it on such a massive scale. And um, this, is fiction. this is fiction. It's fiction. Yeah, it's fiction. But it's, it's a great book. I mean, keep on how much I read when I was locked up. It was this. It was just really well written researched you know how much was possible i don't know but it was it it really you know and the guy's got the statistics and the whole thing and you you really realize reading the book like what a massive issue it is oh it is oh, it is and another another way to attack it was when you're seeing here you see in virginia all over the country and it started with marijuana it's, it's been it's getting legalized all over the country 
right? Right. Recreational use. You, you take the because the Mexican cartels make a lot of money cultivating marijuana. So you right. take that away from them, that's going to hurt their profits a lot too. So right. I think marijuana, you're seeing it. I mean, I know Florida is just medical, but I know Virginia got it approved for a recreational. So it, it is going all over in the Northeast, the Midwest, of course, the West Coast, the up and down is proof of recreational. So that's where you're seeing it. It's going that way. I, I think marijuana, you know, you, Thomas Jefferson even grew marijuana in Monticello, right? Founding fathers. I mean, marijuana has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. People have been smoking it, right? You know, right. it's not my thing. I don't like getting high. I don't like, you know, smoking my lungs. But if some people, that's what they want, like cigarette smoking. I'd rather not be around it, right? I like to eat away from that. I don't like to be around any of that stuff here. But some people like it. I think the edibles now, I think are legal in every state. It gets you high, those edibles. Right. Have you seen that? Every, that's everywhere now. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I the, the, drugs were just never my pro, my, my thing, but I- but this is the thing. I'm, I'm, I definitely agree that you know. To me, look, if you took the money they spent on the prison population and you made going to rehabs affordable, and you did more education, and you legalize a lot of those substances, I think would alleviate the problem considerably. And it listen, and it'd be detrimental to the to the cartels. Absolutely, because then, then you're taxing it here. We're making the money, right? the states and the federal system. So you, you have to eliminate marijuana from being a schedule one banned substance, right? That's the first thing because it's, you can do all the things at the state level, but if you're still a, 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 you use marijuana, you want to buy a firearm and an FFL, federal firearms licensee, you show prohibited. You can't do that because you're still a drug user, right? So right. If you're a drug user, you can't do that. Marijuana is still on the list there. So a lot of things, I know that's passed in the House of Representatives that needs to be approved in the Senate to start making this nationwide. Because I've seen it firsthand. I think we're wasting time in the judicial system, clogging the judicial system, when you have these petty cases. You have ATF went after the worst of the worst, right? The most right. violent. That's what you have to focus on. The most violent repeat offenders, armed traffickers, armed home invaders, guys who want to commit murder for hire, you know, international traffickers. That's you know, gun traffickers. That's what we have to focus on. Not guys who have some weed, they want smoke, and they're doing this on the side. I mean, all the places want to have a ZT policy. Zero tolerance, that's a waste of time. That's you, you, you're clogging the system on, on these people should be treated for health issues, not criminal. They shouldn't criminalize these people, in my opinion. This isn't coming from a guy who's been 26 years in law enforcement who have seen it, right? Uh, I, I just think it is a waste of our tax dollars. It is a waste of time. And we're building more prisons. We need to focus on, and the court system gets overwhelmed with it also. And you don't want any of that. So we have to be smarter. It's marijuana, yes. Hey, we learned, learned the lesson from Prohibition. I wrote a book about it, right? The rise of the outfit here, the Chicago crime bosses. And right. after, well, that's what made Al Capone. That's what made these guys a violence because it was illegal, right? And then once we legalize it, well, sh there goes that. And all of a sudden, the government's making the money, right? They're getting taxed and everybody can enjoy themselves. You're not being criminalized for having a beer or drinking whiskey, which is was ridiculous, right? But the uh, same thing, in my opinion, should apply to marijuana. The other drugs, a little bit tougher to deal with. But we have to come up with solutions. But marijuana is the first gateway, I think, with that. Because, I mean, everybody in college, you, you want, you see how many people in college have to go sometimes to really bad areas to get some weed, right? Right. End up getting hurt, robbed. You, want, you just go to the store, right? It's illegal. I mean, that, that we have to be smart about it. Obviously, I don't want to be around it. I don't want to smell it. Because I went to Kingston for do some work for training. And everywhere in Kingston, you could smell it. The ganja, as they say. Ganjaman, right? It's everywhere. And I, I really don't, I, I didn't care for that smell. That's okay. wrong. Kingston, Kingston in Jamaica, right? Right. Kingston, Jamaica. Okay. They have a lot, they, they grow a lot of, a lot of wheat. They call it ganja over there. Oh, listen. And hey, you know, there's places in Jamaica you can't even go. Oh, that's true. I, I mean, the government doesn't go. Yeah. Like we were, when I went to Jamaica, it's funny, I was, I was on the run and I went Where? to Jamaica. Yeah. And, and we were to have the taxi driver, he's like driving us around and we were like, hey, let's go here, let's go here. And he was like, yeah, you can't go there. And he was like, listen, he's like, the police don't go there. Like, you definitely aren't going there. He's like, we're not going there in my cab. Yeah. And it was like, wow, it's like, it's that bad? Like, what do you mean the police don't go? He's like, no, it's com that section, that area is completely owned and operated by, the, you know, this one gang. To make them possible, like, whoever. Oh, yeah. Try. Yeah. Yeah, they just had a huge arrest, of, I think about five, seven years ago. Guy's name was Coke. 
like from cocaine. Right. Yeah. And now, and, and the people in Kingston were rioting because he obviously, you know, they provide a lot of work and, you know, it, it's like an Escobar type, right? They also give a lot to the community, just like, just like Chapel did, Guzman. They give a lot, right. they help a lot. They know that the little people, they want to care of little people. So they kind of help the little people a lot, but because they, they work for their organization and do stuff like that. That's the same mentality you, you saw out there in Kingston. Yeah. A lot of people just want to go. If I tell them to go to Jamaica, I was going to maybe work there as an attache. But once I saw first half to two weeks there, how the conditions were, no way. I wouldn't bring my family. That's for sure. And I definitely wouldn't go with my family in Mexico because I'll, I'll, I'll also, because at the end of my career, I promoted and I went to ATF headquarters and I, I worked at two years and I was helping briefing the director case with one in command for the central region, who now is number two command for ATF right now. So that's a good contact that, that I have and working and talking and briefing some of the most sensitive cases that ATF was working. So, and then I was going to maybe transfer to Mexico, but then with the issue with Lopez Obrador, what was going on, who was the president of Mexico, they renounced our diplomatic community status as agents. So you think I'm, I'm going to go to Mexico and they don't want to carry farms. So they don't want you armed. They don't want you to have diplomatic community. And I'm going to be kidnapped with my family. I said, no way. I said, I'm eligible to retire. I did my time up here. I enjoyed my career. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then I got into writing. <laughs> right. I, I did a nice trip in writing. Well, I've been, you know, writing like this by a year and a half now since I've been retired. But I, I used to write a lot of reports, right? You get good right. and really detailed in writing a lot and a lot and a lot. So I said, and I always had a thing for it. I like, I like reading. I'm always fascinated with, uh, you know, history and political science and current events. I'm always reading information. So that's what a lot of my books are. You know, I got fiction, nonfiction. But I do a lot of politics. I do a lot of organized crime. And I, and I realized, you know, when I started writing, what, and I'm not here to promote anybody, but, you know, you know, I had a family member. She was in the publishing industry for over 20 years, right? She had, she got laid off and I was talking to her and she said, you know, it's hard at the time, you know, COVID was still around, right? And it was such a huge backlog. And I said, you know, you may want to look at Kindle and with Amazon because you can self publish. Yeah. And you don't have to wait for anybody. Right. And you get like 80, 20, especially digital books, like 75, 25. Right. So, you know, screen on both ends, a screen for my pocketbook and a screen for the environment. We do the digital books. Right. And, and then I'm now doing audio too. And shout out to Sean Milo for that. We'll, we both know him. He's a great guy. And that, that should be coming out. My book, if you're not, now he's a big reader and I've been told a lot of people rather listen to it. Yeah. And it's a great, great story. I, I encourage people to listen to these books and go audible. It should be out hopefully in about a month or less. It be out there. So I looked into it and it worked for me because I go at my pace. I do whatever subject matter, because you know how it is. A publisher, you get rid of the middleman who's only cares about making money. I'm always, it's not about always making money. It's about putting something out there, which I want to talk about, read about. Right. I was going to say also, you know, as a writer, you make like, you'll make $6, $6.50, $7 on a, on a book that you sell on, on Amazon. And if the publisher sells it, you're making a dollar fifteen, a dollar thirty five. Like, you know, and look, the, I, I got a I, when I was locked up, I got a book deal. They were in Barnes and Nobles. You know, that's great. Like, how how exciting is that? That's super cool. But in the end, like six months ago, this is five years later. <laughs> six months ago is the first time I actually got a, a small check from them by because it took that long to pay back the advance they gave me. They give me like a thirty five hundred dollar advance, and listen, in prison, thirty five hundred bucks is a lot, a lot of money. But you know, it just took that long to even pay it back. That's ridiculous. Now you, you would have made a lot more money w with Kindle for for sure. Yeah, and, you know, I, I like doing all. I mean, and I enjoy just like I did my cases. I wore many hats. <laughs> right. I play that with my books. I do my own book covers. I do my own editing. I, I, I write the material. I choose what, what I'm going to write about. I just did a book that just came out. I think I forwarded to you on Facebook, a messenger on uh, Jim Jones, right? In, the, in, the, in, the, in Jonestown, on the massacre, because it's now 45 years. And I want to do a little bit deeper dive in that. And I found some pretty interesting things in there and mistakes that were made. And I, I thought things, and I also give my opinion, right? Based on my expertise. As, right. There's a worse U.S. cult mass murder in U.S. history. Almost nine, oh, 950 dead. Right. I was, I was going to say almost a thousand people or something like 150 kids or 200 kids or something. How many kids? More of that. More of that. That's horrible. You could hear, if you haven't heard the Jim Jones tape, 
because he recorded the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. You should hear that. Horrible. Horrible. My kids are crying and everything else. And the mother, his wife, Marcelina, her name was, she's telling him because these are his kids too. He's poisoning. He said, let the kids live. And he goes, and just like this, he goes, mother, 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 please. You know, he's already crazy. Mother, yeah. please. Like and very sarcastic and nasty. Like says, you know, children hurry because they already killed the congressman, right? They, he yeah. had his goons go out and already kill the congressman, Leo Ryan and his entourage, NBC and everybody else, the Washington Post, they gunned him down because they knew he, they had 20 defectors. He knew it was over. It, it yeah. was over in Guyana. And, and then he, he said, when they came back, said, hey, some escaped. He knew it was over. He, he knew they were going to come down, put him in jail, shut it all down. And he'd rather, he, he was so selfish. He'd rather everybody kill themselves to make that statement. He called it the suicidal revolution, which is insanity. All these people's lives that came in and for a better life, lost their lives. Drinking the Kool-Aid. That's what it's called, right. drinking the Kool-Aid. It wasn't even Kool-Aid. F- Flavor Aid. Yeah. Flavor Aid. But Flavor-Aid. It, poor Kool Aid. Yeah. Poor Kool Aid got hit with Kool Aid, drinking the Kool Aid this whole time. I'm drinking the Kool Aid. Was that from Kool Aid? Flavor Aid. But I was gonna say, take the the problem is everybody always fakes face. Everybody always focuses on the the murder, right? Right. That the the mass suicide. If you even if you remove if you remove that though, his rise is amazing. Oh my god! His yeah. ability to manipulate is amazing, and the fact. That he starts Jonestown, and then the senator shows up, and they they realize the senator. They realize what's happening. Senator, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, Congressman's going to go back to the United States. He's yeah. going to he's going to tell everybody they're going to obviously send over the troops and grab these guys. I mean, it's, it's coming down. But then he actually sends his guys to kill him. That's unbelievable. And, and they do like that story. That that's the great thing. What what I love about I love about nonfiction. You couldn't come up with that. No. Like that is so bizarre. It's, it, it, you know, the term, you know, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. That's true. Who, I agree. Is, if you told someone that and it hadn't happened, they'd be like, yeah, bro, that's just like, it's, it's, it's too out there to believe. Sure. I agree. Everybody would believe, like, that's just too, and it, but it happened. It, it's, it's an amazing story. He's another guy that grew up, and I didn't know his background until I reached, this is the reason why I do stuff like this. I love researching nonfiction. I love it. And I've done a lot of these. So if you like what we're talking about, check out the book, please. It's it's on Amazon. It just just came out. But w- with him, he came out out of absolute poverty. Yeah, object poverty. I mean, out of Indiana, right? And in uh, Lynn, Indiana, his father was a uh, War One veteran who suffered serious serious chemical attacks. You know how the war was in the trenches, right? Yeah, that- he, couldn't, he couldn't breathe. He couldn't work. Couldn't do anything. Guy was disabled pretty much, and the pension was horrible back then and then they had the great depression they lost their home the government the, the the company the merged company seized it and the family had to buy them a shack and they lived in a shack with no plumbing no and and no electricity an mm-hmm. absolute horrible situation so that's why he i think he needed to find something and i think that's what he found you know religion and ministry his his goal because he he would obviously perverse it completely and right and, and he would end up you know the people's temple was, was ends up being a cult pretty much yeah. because you, to join, you have to turn all your finances to, right? All your money goes to him. He'll take care of you. He'll find your housing. And he took advantage, and I hate to say it, it took advantage of a lot of minorities and a lot of disadvantaged people, right? And the politicians, because he came up with integration, right? He was one of the first guys integrating the churches with blacks and whites and, and everything else. What was unpopular in Indiana, right? He ended up going to San Francisco. Well, of course, very liberal out there right became very popular he would help get votes for the mayor and in 76 walter mondale and jimmy carter was there and he helped california go blue right so he, he can beat ford so that's why they were embarrassed humiliated right angry they didn't want a full investigation on jonestown but this guy ryan give him he was a democrat but he knew there was something wrong and but this is where i criticize him in the book a little bit when you know this guy is so unstable right he, they had already information, affidavits and defectors, that they were already doing mock drills like this, drinking the Kool-Aid. They, they already trained them that if this happens, this is what we're going to do. They have people, what they call white knight drills, where they have gunfire over their heads. So they would just stay down and they would drink the Kool-Aid. He had all the cyanide prepared for this. So 
You don't think? But I mean, imagine how. I, but I don't you yeah. look. But I, I hear what you're saying. But yeah. if you were telling me that, I would be thinking oh, that's crazy. It's too crazy. Like that's not going to happen. Like that's never happened. Like like I mean, in the in history, it's yeah. happened. But it, it's so unbelievable that an American citizen and that a group of American citizens, Americans, yeah, would have done this, or that anybody would follow, or anybody would follow through. Like, okay, he's doing it. I get it. He's out there, but. That's probably not. It's not going to happen. And you know who's going to and who's going to kill a senator? That's not going to happen. Yeah. With a not, senator, not, or congressman, congressman. Yeah, not congressman. not just not just a congressman, but the entourage that's with yeah, him. The staff, yeah, the staff. And there's one lady who was his staff member. She survived by playing dead for 24 hours uh, on the strip there, and, and until the army came in to rescue her. She played dead for. She had five bullet wounds inside her. She just wrote a book and, and a great interview. I haven't seen her talk about it. She gets very emotional. Now she took over his old position like 10 years ago. So now she's a congressperson from that from that district. Okay. Yeah. But, wow. Uh, unbelievable story. But you know what? A lot of people didn't commit suicide. But what the investigation shows, they wanted to leave. They were, yeah. they were the, the guards, his, his what he called the red, because he was a communist. And those yeah. who don't know, he, he he's a hardcore, very much Marxist-Leninist communist. He hated this country because obviously the racial issues, he called it pretty much a racist, fascist nation, right? And he wanted to set up this Marxist utopia out there in Jonestown. He, he was big uh, Fidel Castro. He, he was a big fan of the Soviet Union. He even had Soviet officials come in and say, this is the perfect Marxist utopia that I have set up here. And they congratulated him. They went out there and said, man, you've done here. But at the same time, these people were oppressed. They had him, he had him work 12 hour days. He fed him rice and beans. While he ate like a, like a king, and at the end, those who didn't want to commit suicide, the goon squad, what I call them, the Red Brigade, came out with in injections and injected everybody in the shoulder with a cyanide. And you see that, and 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 so a lot of people were murdered. And to me, when you're brainwashed like that, you're, you're being murdered. Because it didn't didn't some of the people even try and run off into the woods and stuff, and they were shooting at them? Or? No, they they didn't. You can't. You can't. You, no escape. You you have to die. When he, when he said it's time to die, it, it is time to die. There, there was no like, hey, this was a, a mad. Now, these people were murdered. I mean, look, a lot of people say, you know, especially children, and, and they have no no say in it. They were forced to drink that, small children. They were they were killed, and they were a lot. I think there were 200-something children that were murdered, and they're, including his own children. And it, his own wife even protested and said, this, this has to be a different way. And then it, then it, it, it goes, mother, 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 please. You know, he, he goes like, you know, he gets, he's already in that crazy psycho world. And he tells children, we have to hurry, children. We have to hurry. We have to send a message to the world, the suicidal revolution. I mean, he was just off his, I mean, who in the right mind will see? Because he wants to send a message. And then he didn't take the Kool-Aid himself, the cyanide. He, he shot himself in the head. Did you, well, the, so I've got, I'm going to butcher this guy's name. The the guy who wrote Fight Club, oh. Chuck Pol Polnicek. Yeah. I, I, I know I butchered his name. Anyway, he he wrote a book called Survivor, mm. and it talks about a mass suicide, and he, he talks about several mass suicides in the book, but it's very much written in the same vein as Fight Club. You know, he has that real choppy writing style, it, it's, which is, is great because that book really moved along. He also talks about, like, that's a great book with about multiple different types of suicide. It talks about a heaven gate, Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate, yep. Yeah, that sui mass suicide, but nothing like like nothing compares to to. There's know, nothing to we've never had. It. it it was the worst mass murder until 9/11, right? With Americans, right? I see that. So you know, and and and, and with that, so going back to my point, I, I thought the congressman made a mistake. I know he had a history of being very proactive. He he's a Democrat, and remember th this guy Jones helped the Democrats win the 76 election, the national election. He helped it, it win a lot. Because he was key getting the votes out with African Americans, because he had an integrated church. He was a socialist. Remember, and there's a very socialist area. So, the, the State Department did not give him a lot of information while I was reading. And according to the staff member who survived, what really was going on? Because remember, they had people already saying about all these defectors saying, "Hey, dude, they're doing mock exercises. They're torturing people in there. If you stand up anything, they'll put you in this hot box. They'll put you underground. They they put you in a well." They, they really torture people. You better get on the program. There's no escaping. There's no leaving. This is what they're doing to you. So I think it was a big mistake. 
him knowing what's going on there, knowing these guys are armed, he knew they were armed. I personally, just being common sense, is that I need the guy in government to help me, give me security, protection. He went unarmed. With He thinking that the media guys, oh, you know, I have, have NBC with me at the Washington Post. They're going to, he's not going to shoot us with, with the media here. Yeah. Kill everybody. This guy's not following the Geneva Convention. Like I can't shoot reporters or, or medics. Don't you know I'm a congressman? Yeah. I don't think he cares. Yeah. Sure, man. And he, he care. So that's the, you can never underestimate your opponent. Never underestimate. Yeah. Be prepared. I, I think he would have sit, if he would have had the army or at least some representatives and they saw the evidence, I think they could have arrested him, taken him there and he would have saved those lives. I, I think it was just approached the wrong way that, that, and at the end, knowing that kind of person, how volatile he was, how could they not think that would not trigger that after he'd been practicing that, right? He pretty much said that's what he's going to do. Arrogance. So that's my yeah. criticism in the book. If you read it, I, I, I blame a lot of the Carter administration at the time for, for obviously he went out there as, as a congressman, he could do his own investigation, right? It, it, different bodies of, of government. You have the executive and legislator, legislator, right. but they should have given him some support and protection because he, he was set up to fail. He was set up to fail and they failed badly. And look what we have, the consequences. So something you got to really think about this guy. And, and and he really, there's a reason why he went, he created Jonestown because he was this close, again, picked up in the U.S. for obviously tax evasion. He really didn't have a church. He had all this protection as a church, but it was a cult and he was stealing and he was abusing. Right. He would he, he would rape the members. He would even rape males. So he, he was involved in a lot of bad things. So he knew his time was coming. That's why he set up Guyana. Uh, I think originally he wanted to go in Brazil. But it was easier for him because he, in Guyana was a British colony, a former British colony, English speaking. And it just worked out easier for him to go to Guyana, which at the time had become a socialist nation also, very communist. So that's another issue they had to deal with. So interesting read. If you like what we talked about, I think you'll like the story of Jim Jones. If you don't know much about it, a lot of the younger generation, I've noticed, doesn't know anything what happened in Jonestown. So yeah. read about it. You'll be shocked. And the video, his video, his tape, the death tape, you got to listen to that. Of, a, of the brink of a madman with a thousand people jumping off a cliff. Yes. Well, shoot, I was going to say something too when you were talking. I was thinking, oh, oh, I know what it was. It was the uh, one of the things you were talking about finances. Is it reminded me uh -huh. uh, of David Koresh? Oh, Waco. Yeah, yeah. He would have everybody. He would have all the women and everybody go and get on food stamps and get on. You know, like that. That's a big thing with the cults. One of the things they do is they. They immediately have everybody sign up for, you know, they call it what they call it bleeding the bleeding the beast. They, they call it like bleeding the beast where you sign up for all the subsidies and all that you get as much as you can. Of course, they all live there. And he, of course, you know, he's got air conditioning. He's eating well. They're all he's like a king. Yeah. Yeah. That's typical with this communist, this, you know, socialist system. Look at Nicolas Maduro. You, look, you looked at Fidel Castro. You look at Xi Jinping in China. You yeah. look at Kim Jong Un in, in North Korea. They, they abuse the people, the little people. They think this is better for them. No, this is the best system out here, folks. Don't get conned into that. This this is the best system out there. It's, it's, nothing is perfect, but it is the best system. At least you know you can work your way up. You want to get your own education. You want to do things. You can make something in your life here, and it happens. One thing you can never take away from you. And I tell people this all the time: is your education. They can never, no matter what happens, they can never take your education from you. They can't take your drive from you. They can't take your de determination from you. That's built within you, no matter what government happens in you. So educate it and be free. And, and there's a lot of brainwashing. And be a person, ask questions, get different sources. Don't just accept one source. And unfortunately, these people did that, right? And you see the yeah. communists do that. And, 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 and he was very good at propaganda and brainwashing where you weren't allowed to get other information from other sources. It was his source information, healthy diet every day, that way, that's what Castro did the same thing. The CCP does the same thing in China, and I've written about th those books in China. They like their one-party system as our way or the highway. So it'll end up one of three ways for you. Either your death, imprisonment, or they're going to kick you out of the country. That's a reality. That's a reality we live in the 21st century. All right. That's depressing. So, all right, so. But true, though, right? You really brought the you really brought the the tenor of the show down. Is no, but 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 we're it though. We're, we're the shining light here. So hey, good thing is we're living the good country. <laughs> Be happy you were born in communist China. 
or or Venezuela or or North North Korea. That is just awesome. have you ever seen the videos out there, man? That is depressing to see that. So those are the books. Also, all the kind of books I've written about. So I have such a such a huge for almost no, just did sixtieth. Jim Jones is my sixtieth book. I just did my sixtieth book in a little over a year. So it's it's pretty cool. You can find it now. I'm doing uh, the Audible books will be coming out. That should be coming out within a, a month on ATF Undercover. And then I'm doing more with Sean. We're just doing the one on mass shootings. We just started that one. So some of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history. And based on my background, solutions to that. I mean, that could be a show within itself. What, what What's going on in our country with mass shootings? Th- that's depressing for me. And how we can stop them. And how, how what we can do. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen the video or not. And I talked to a lot of people about this. I've done shows about this. Ovalde, Texas. What happened at Rob Elementary? No. About, I haven't. Yeah, you have, you have to look at the video. 77 minutes while the shooter's in the classroom killing the students and teachers while the police is outside. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I've, I've seen bits and pieces. You gotta see the whole thing. It, 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 it is really, all of it's out there now. And what's really upsetting, and you gotta watch this in the audience to look at this, one of the officers, female officers, you know, they forget they have the body cams on, right? Right. And another guy was recording her because everybody has it on. And I guess she had her off, but he had his on. And they're outside. They are already finally. The, the it was the feds. It was the border patrol. The tac the tac the unit came in there, and and it wasn't the locals. The early ones went in there, and there were I think they were like 15, 20 miles away, and they responded. And they're the ones that came in the classroom, and they're the ones that killed them, who, who killed the Ramos inside there. It wasn't the locals who stayed outside. She said, he "said It hey, wasn't your daughter in there." And one of the guys was saying, "No, no, my daughter's a VPK, but if my daughter was in there, I would definitely have gone in." Whoa, come on. My daughter was in there, but how, what, the other people's daughters wasn't, children weren't good enough to go in there? I mean, that's what you, you, you serve and protect. This is, this is what the call is about. When you got that kind of situation and kids are, are, are dying, that one of the children, one of the girls was calling 911 saw her teacher get her head blown off, right? And the other students are dying, bleeding in there. It says, please come and help using the teacher's phone, right? To call 911. You, you stand outside the classroom because, oh, he's got a, a, a rifle. We have handguns. Uh, well, they have nothing, right? Go in there, get a shotgun. You got shotguns, you got everything else. That's, those are the kind of things I talk about where you need people who are teachers who are willing to protect. Teachers are willing to die for their students. Some of them were shooting their students at the end, taking the bullets for their kids. They want to fight. And, and those, just like after 9 11, when we had the, well, after the pilots, right, taking over the airplanes, yeah. they had the option to be armed, right? We're, we're, we're to the point where we would probably have to do the same thing with administrators, teachers, the same thing because. Some police officers happened in Miami and Parkland. They stayed outside, right? And and and, uh, and Cruz ends up Nicholas Cruz ends up killing a lot of the students and teachers inside because he has a rifle, right? I understand it's not a fair fight. You have a handgun, he has better range, it's faster, and he's going through your, your body armor. But these kids have nothing, and the teachers have nothing. And right. staying outside, that's that's being a coward. Act, after shoot training, so you got two people in, you can do it and you address the guy because that's what that's what you're supposed to do. So. I address a lot of that. Book's going to be coming on Audible soon. It's already on that. And I, I talk a lot of scenarios, what we've learned, what we haven't learned, and the problems we have. And we may have to become more like Israel to protect ourselves if because the response time is too long. And if a lot of these places don't want you armed, well, then you have to do something about it because this this doesn't end. We just had another one in, in Michigan State, right? It, it, it just seems like every week there's a new active shooter. As we speak right now, Matt, there's someone else who got triggered. It's going to do the same thing. Because we have yeah. a mental health crisis in this country that's unimaginable. And on top of that, easy access to weapons. That's that's the problem. That's another that's a, that's a depressing thing about 21st century America right now. And I put that in my book here. It's it's no solution because the only other solution is a good guy with a bad taking on bad guys with guns, right? Letting everybody be armed. And because in Indiana a few months ago, in a food court, in a mall, a guy had armed himself in the bathroom, he started shooting. But somebody was was armed, could see a weapons permit, and addressed them and killed them. Yeah, you never see that. Course. You never see that video though. Yeah. Hopefully That's not we'll the see they push. No, no, no. We gotta push other stuff. So those are things I want your audience to think about. Good conversations, serious topics we take it on. But that's what I write about. Things are happening and solution. My back, especially with ATF, my back with guns and stuff like this. It's really things that shouldn't be politicized by the right or the left. This is about us, right? Our family, because nobody wants their kids killed. Everybody wants to have their peace of mind. I have two daughters. 
safe at school. That's the worst case scenario. You get that call. School got shut down. A madman's it's, it's in the loose there. And they, they do nothing. Uh, Pulse nightclub. I mean, it's just case after case. The police don't go in sometimes. Pulse nightclub, they spend like 12 hours. Well, he's, he's there, remember, in the gay nightclub? The guy yeah. who's shooting everybody in the gay nightclub? I mean, they, they, they wait for the SWAT team while the people are in the bathroom and he's lining up in the stalls and shooting everybody. Why aren't they going in? So it is just one after another. And, and, you, I, and I pick apart each one. So it's an interesting read, but we have to learn and what we have to do. And, and it's about people being armed. These gun-free zones, Matt, yes, yeah. the bad guys are going to victimize you because they, they're going to thing. That doesn't change a fucking thing. No, they're going to be armed. They know that's easy to, easy pickings because I've done a lot of shows with guys and, I'm, you know, just my own history who have a history and that's what they look for. You know, we, they look for the bank that doesn't have the armed security guy, right? They, they, they look for the place in the mall which is nobody armed, no policing or the theater. These yeah. are things we have to prepare for. If you outlaw guns, like, you know, outlaws, like, you know, look, let, let's face it, criminals are not going to abide by that. No. They're not going to abide by that rule. Oh, we're not allowed to have the gun? Oh, well, then I won't. What are you talking about? But if you're willing to commit a mass shooting, you're willing to break the law, the gun laws, you know, and you're going to, there's just too many guns. There's too, you'll never get rid of all the guns. No, you can't get rid of the guns. I mean, the United States is the biggest manufacturer of weapons in the world. Yeah. I mean, the Europeans have come here. I mean, you have Glock, used to be made in Austria, it's made in Georgia. Six Hour, which is made in Germany, it's made in the Northeast. H and K, also in Germany, made. They've come here because we're buying it all. America. Right. I, I mean, I'm, I have my collection too. But you have to protect your family because if you expect call nine one one and the police to come save you from a home invader in your house, don't hold your breath. Yeah, no. Nah. You better get your concealed weapons permit. You better practice. And if you haven't shot your gun, and that's the first time you're going to shoot it, that's not the time to learn. You better be competent with it because it, you're going to be pumped. You're going to be drilling. You got some crazy coming at you. You better be ready how to use it and defend yourself. Because the worst thing is you see somebody do something bad to your family and you wish you could have stopped it. Those are just lessons. Just a, just a lesson for a guy who retired law enforcement, what I've seen, and hopefully people can learn and just pass in some wisdom on what we can do. All right. That's awesome, man. You re- are you you ready? Yeah, we're, we're good. good. We good? Yeah. Yeah. I just, you mean, do a little, little promo on some. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I usually say that, you know, obviously I'm going to put we'll, we'll, Colby, which is anybody who watches this knows who Colby is. Colby will put, you know, the, the book links. Like if you send me the book links, He'll put your book links in the description oh, great. Uh, of the of the video. So people can just go to the description box. You know, they just hit the button and boom, it'll have a whole list where they can just click on it and bring you straight to your Amazon account or your, awesome. you know, your Amazon book. And uh, yeah, buy I, the- I'll, I'll, I just have an Amazon author page with all my books. I'll just okay. send you the Amazon author page that I have. It's it's Better. a great one. So I let, let my I'll let the audience know also, I, I do also have a Amazon author page too. You can Google it. I'll go obviously go on Amazon, which is my name. I think it's there, Ignacio Esteban. And you can see all my books, 60 books from fiction to nonfiction. I'll, I also do fiction books also, which is fun reads. I also do pictorial books. And I think you'll really like, if you like organized crime, I have a lot to do. This is a true crime channel. I have a lot in organized crime. My personal experience is dealing with biker group. We haven't even talked about that yet. So that could be another show down the road if you want, doing the one percenters, doing the outlaws, the hell's angels. The Mongols. I've done books on Yakuza. I've done books on LA gangs. I was in LA for eight months between the Bloods and Crips of Mexican Mafia. I've, I've done books on MS 13, Mana Salatrucha. So there's a lot of stuff here. If you like this stuff, obviously I've done books on, on uh, the Mafia, Castro, the Mafia, and the history of the Mafia in, in, in Havana. The, the rise and fall of the Mafia in Havana led to the rise in Las Vegas. And I talked all the political side because of my family. They were there, they experienced it. And you see it firsthand what's going on there. So a lot of cool things. Please look it up and have the audio stuff coming out on Audible ATF Undercover. And hopefully they get the other books out there through Sean. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do some of those. Like actually just do a show just on that one category. You know, yeah. on, on like one category of like the Akuza. Do one on just like the biker gangs, like that sort of thing. That would be because we were kind of all over the place. But but yeah, that we could we could definitely do that. We definitely it was fun. 